Ladies and gentlemen, this episode of the podcast is brought to you by Babbel. When you're traveling to a destination where you don't know the language, it can be challenging to accomplish even the simplest of tasks. Thankfully, there is Babbel, the number one selling language learning app. Through Babbel's bite-sized lessons, you'll learn new language skills that you can actually use in the real world. From greetings, menus, and directions to gaining a deeper understanding of the culture, Babbel is a travel essential. Babbel's 15-minute lessons make it the perfect way to learn a new language on the go. Other language learning apps use AI for their lessons plan, but Babbel lessons were created by over 100 language experts, and their teaching method has been scientifically scientifically proven to be effective. With Babbel, you can choose from 14 different languages, including Spanish, French, Italian, and German. Plus, Babbel's speech recognition technology helps you improve your pronunciation and accent. There are so many ways to learn with Babbel. In addition to lessons, you can access podcasts, games, videos, stories, and even live classes. Start your new language learning journey today with Babbel. Right now, when you purchase a three-month Babbel subscription, you'll get an additional three months for free. That's six months for the price of three. Just go to Babbel.com and use the promo code Cleared Hot. That is B-A-B-B-E-L.com, code Cleared Hot. Babbel, language for life. Today's episode is also brought to you by Soul. And I'm not talking about, you know, potentially what may or may not live inside of you. I'm talking about the bottom of your feet. Soul, the sustainable orthopedic footwear company that seeks to bring peace where the ground meets your feet. Soul is a footwear company that seeks to bring comfort to your soul, maybe best known for making footbeds, seeks to enhance your mobility, improve your foot health, and keep you in the game longer. It's trying to put 3D shape back into footwear, asks if your feet aren't flat, why is your footwear, builds shoes from the inside out, and guarantees your feet will feel better with Soul. 85% of the population will have one or more foot-related ailments in their lifetime. Soul has created a foot bed, as in a great place to rest your soul, that is affordable, customizable, and improves people's everyday foot comfort. Millions of customers rave about the product, and two-thirds of Soul customers have two or more pairs of footbeds. Once you know the comfort, pain relief, improved proprioception, performance enhancement, and injury prevention benefits of Soul footbeds, you will want them in every shoe you own. What's more is Soul's created its own recycling program, ReCork, to collect and upcycle used wine corks to make its products. So far, ReCork has collected over 125 million wine stoppers that get ground down and reused into the company's own footbeds and shoes. Circularity exists. Soul has an amazing offer for the first time customers of 50% off through yoursoul.com slash cleared hot. So you can try Soul for yourself. They are so confident you will love them Though they also offer a 90-day money-back guarantee. Very hard to go wrong. The Cleared Hot offer is applicable to all items on the Soul store, be it footbeds or footwear. Yoursoul.com slash Cleared Hot. This episode is also brought to you by Helix Sleep, and I'm glad that it came up because this is a question that I get asked often. Are those mattresses legit? As a matter of fact, I was having this conversation this morning because I'm getting ready to buy another one. There are plenty of reasons not to get a good night's sleep. Don't let your mattress be one of them. If you don't know what you need or what you may want, Helix Sleep has a quiz that takes just two minutes to complete and matches your body type and sleep preference to the perfect mattress for you. Helix knows that everybody's unique, so they have several different mattress models to choose from. They have soft, medium, and firm, of course. Mattress is great for cooling you down if you sleep hot, and even a Helix Plus mattress for plus-size folks. Myself and my daughter have already taken this quiz, and we each sleep on a different Helix mattress. So if you're looking for a mattress, you take the quiz, you order the mattress that you're matched to, and the mattress comes right to your door, shipped for free. You don't ever need to go to a mattress store again. Helix is awesome. Actually, I would describe them as amazing, but you do not need to take my word for it. Helix was awarded the number one best overall mattress pick of 2020 by GQ and Wired Magazine. Go to helixsleep.com slash cleared hot, take their two-minute sleep quiz, and they'll match you to a customized mattress that will give you the best sleep of your life. They come with a 10-year warranty, and you get to try it out for 100 nights risk-free. They'll even pick it up for you if you don't love it, but I wouldn't worry about that. Helix is offering up to $200 off all mattress orders and two free pillows to the listeners at helixsleep.com slash cleared hot. Last but not least, this episode is brought to you by my absolute favorite, and in my opinion, the single best cereal on the face of the planet. That's right. I'm talking about Magic Spoon. I loved cereal growing up. Who doesn't love cereal growing up? But as you get older, maybe when you tip into your 40s, you realize what's in cereal, probably not the best for you. Thankfully, there is Magic Spoon. Zero grams of sugar, 13 to 14 grams of protein, and only four net grams of carbs in each serving. Only 140 calories in that serving, and it's keto-friendly, gluten-free, grain-free, soy-free, and low carb. They also give you the chance to build your own box. Because if you go to their website, you're going to see that there's a variety of boxes, and you might want to try them all. Well, customize your own box. You can choose from things like cocoa, fruity, frosted peanut butter, blueberry, cinnamon, cookies and cream, and maple waffle. Yes, I said all those things. I said what I said. You can do what you do. 
All right. Go to magicspoon.com slash cleared hot to grab a custom bundle of cereal and try it today. Be sure to use the promo code cleared hot at checkout to save $5 off your order. Magic Spoon is so confident in their product. It's backed with a 100% happiness guarantee. So if you don't like it for any reason, they'll refund your money. No questions asked. Remember, get your next delicious bowl of guilt-free cereal at magicspoon.com slash cleared hot and use the code cleared hot to save $5 off. Boom. That's it. We've done it. My guests today, you know who they are. They're Evan Hafer and Mike Glover, two of my favorite people on the face of the planet. Evan Hafer is, of course, allegedly the founder and CEO of Black Rifle Coffee. Mike Glover is the founder, CEO of Fieldcraft Survival. They were both Green Berets, and they also both worked for the Alphabet Soup Agency, known as the CIA. And that's it. Let's just get into it. Episode 210 with Evan Haver and Mike Glover. Enjoy. Okay, I got the red smoke. Gun run! North and south! West of the smoke! West of the smoke! Okay, copy. West of the smoke. I'm looking at danger close now. You guys know the secret to pissing in a bottle? I know we've all... How many of you have... I actually haven't watched somebody drink their own piss. I've only listened to I've it. I've done that three times. I'm, I guys easily broke, three you times. You broke the yeah. cardinal rule. Yeah. You have to... The diameter of the top of the bottle has to be substantially different than the one you're drinking out of. Correct. A mistake people will make is they'll put two bottles with the same diameter top. <laughs> so when you yep. put it to your mouth, it feels... It better. You better different. know the difference because otherwise you're going to swig your own piss. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Ambien was two to three times to blame. <laughs> to blame. Did so you that. spit it out? Get it down. <laughs> you I got head. like three gulps in. <laughs> yeah. Three gulps. The best one was my, uh, in Afghanistan, my roommate, he used to freeze water in the little crappy fridge. Yeah, yeah. And then he'd break open, he'd crack the bottle, so the frozen bottle of water. Yep. And then make ice cubes for his whiskey. That makes sense. So he would cut the bottom out of the bottles. Right. And I woke up one morning and we had just been in a gunfight that night, like it was super late in direct fire and stuff. So I was just smoked out of my mind. I woke up and I big, picked up a bottle that was, had the bottom cut out of it. I pissed the entire bladder into, onto my feet yep. of course in you did. our fire base, yeah, in of course our you room did. Yeah. and just sent it. It was like, fuck it. Yeah. And then just took the water bottle that was next to it, poured it on my feet, like, sprinkled them off and got back in my little bunk. It was like, fuck it. Should happen to man. It's taxpayer money well spent. It happens yeah. to come. Millions back. of dollars of training. I was in um, a little known area called Spin Bulldog. Do you guys Ooh, ever yeah. know of that place? Yeah, I've been through there. It's a, it can be spicy. It's a shithole. It spicy. It's a shithole. Yeah. It's a super shithole. And <laughs> I tried to figure out if, if a uh, five gallon, one of those brown five gallon water jugs, you, you yeah. know what I'm talking about. The ones that you'd like carry around, they're yeah. fucking green or brown or whatever. Yeah. I'm trying to figure out if, I actually pissed five gallons in, in, in my room over the course of that entire rotation. You were just filling that thing up. I was just trying to fill it up. Mm. It was gross. It was disgusting. It was so, it was so gross. <laughs> like I'm almost so dry heaved just now. Yeah, yeah. Like, so I know gross. that smell. Yeah, I know yeah, the, yeah. I know yeah. the taste. It's would, like ammonia. You would cap it in between, right? Huh? You would, I'm assuming. Yeah, yeah. I'd have to cap it. But dude, towards when the end, towards it, the end, you're like, oh, God oh, damn. And you're, but I'm not a quitter. I'm just not a quitter. So I tried. Oh. Um, it's kind of like beer because it's fermented. Like it's the oh, oh man. But I I'll know exactly what, what it what it is. It's the guy it. coming into the hooch after me, I can't even imagine what he thought. What? Did you pass <laughs> down the information? What was in there? Absolutely you, not. I was going to say you absolutely leave it. That's not. The move. You yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't address yeah, it. Yeah, you, yeah. you don't. Then they don't. use it as a real water jug, <laughs> yeah. and then just yeah, they just <laughs> <laughs> rinse it out. Everybody thought we were talking about this earlier, which is. Because they're, we were talking about the shirt, right? The the tiger stripe uh, Hawaiian Saga, shirt. Yeah. It, it's, not, it's not serious. It's not meant to be a serious shirt. It's like everybody has this like serious tone, obviously, out there because everybody's like a really serious, tough guy. Everybody, right? <laughs> Are they though? Well, on the internet, what I like to call them is like Twitter tough guys, right? But this is not a serious shirt. And I'm not defending it in any nature. I'm just saying like, it's meant just to be a fucking fun... Shirt. Stupid shirt because I like fun, stupid shit. And we were talking about um, all the fun, stupid shit. And literally, if people, well, literally, um, people shouldn't take me literally. They shouldn't take you literally. If Unless they, we're very specific. Like, hey, I really mean this. Yeah. Outside of that, mm. like, I never 
get too serious about jack or shit. I truly don't. I don't think you could navigate your way through life if you took everything seriously. No. And just to double down on what you're saying, it would be unwise for people to take literally what I say very often. <laughs> because I will say inappropriate things. Mm. It could be construed as rude. Right. Appropriate. Hmm. Mean. Uh, mean. <laughs> uh, is that the military though? Is that what like, when you've seen the worst side of everything? But you have to put it in a context yeah. too. Like if I'm looking directly at someone like, hey, you should go, you should go find every dick between here and Kentucky and line them up and suck them. <laughs> yeah. Obviously I'm not being serious. And it's the, like if I have a serious delivery, you probably shouldn't listen to me. No. Hey, it, and the other thing is, is it's not logistically possible. So if if they're it's like, hey, logistically you're, improbable, I think I yeah. could actually make that happen. But well, you, you have to have a willing oh, yeah. participant, yeah. and then you also have to define: Many. is that it a straight plans. line? Is it an area? Like tip what type of tip, swamp? Tip to tail? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like this is like there's there's a lot that needs to go into the planning of this just to even justify what the commander's intent would be. We should whiteboard that. Right yeah, after we should. This. We should absolutely. just as a practice <laughs> business. Development. <laughs> I mean, it's going to take a lot of participation, but maybe that's what we need to bring our country together more as, yeah. far, as opposed to apart. You, we should all whiteboard <laughs> sucking dicks from here to, where'd you say, Tennessee or Kentucky? I Whatever. Usually say, yeah, it varies. Usually uh, I say Kentucky. I don't know why. I don't know anybody right. from Kentucky. I don't know if I've ever been there. Or I'll say between wherever you are in the Mississippi River. Yeah. Those two resonate with me. Yeah. <laughs> But if you I think no about it, Mississippi <laughs> River is long. It That's is. one of the parts where you'd have you'd have to define like where am I going? One hundred percent. It does arc out to the east in some spots. Because if you told me that that was something I had to do, I would go as far north as I could because obviously the population starts to get thinner, so there would be less work. <laughs> and this is true. And and it's going to be flatter. I think it'll be easier, you know, drive, you know, straight line distance. <laughs> if you started that one in San Diego, it'd take you a long time. I could time draw pictures to, to this whole discussion. Diego. Seriously, if you're, doing, you're working your way through them the South, wow. over there, like you got a yeah. lot of crazy shit you got to get through. I'm sweating profusely San, right now. San Diego and LA County have like 28 million people. I know. It's going to be a long, you pack a lunch. Ugh. You're going to be eddied out for a while. I, I need to get some miles under me. You know, like I, I got to get going. So yeah, like the northern, you, the northern latitudes would be better on that. You'd one. have to. Yeah. You just came from San Diego, right? Mm -hmm. What, like, what do you think about that place now? Well, I've, so let me see. I lived there for, damn, probably 15 years. No. Yes. So oh, really? A little bit of time when I was out of the military too. Um, I didn't spend enough time there to get a true sense of how they are, uh, how life is going on in the, pandemic era. The yeah. fact that I still have to right. use that yeah. term is insane. What I will say though, is there, I, I feel like in a lot of the more densely populated areas that there is an underlying sense of uncertainty and fear, which I don't feel where I live. And maybe because it's so much smaller, maybe because right. people know better. No, not know better. They know people better. And maybe because it's a little bit more spread out. But I watch people, you know, you're walking down the sidewalk and they'll take a big arc around you. So right. they'll And they'll intentionally try to create that space and distance. And it's just something that I'm not used to seeing where I live. Yeah. So it's different in that respect, but I wasn't there long enough to really get a sense of how the businesses are doing. Yeah. When, uh, I, when I did Jocko's podcast a few months ago, um, I had dinner with a couple of friends on Beachside. And it was like a, a seafood restaurant where you eat outside. Mm -hmm. And eating outside of San Diego, I think county, that, that's how they got through a lot of the stuff because they were open to it versus some places right. where like, we're not doing anything. Also beautiful weather year round. So it's kind of, it was Dude, kind of their jam before. I flew yeah, from yeah. here. It was like 89 degrees. When I landed there, it was like 72. I was like, hey, what? And I was like, Dude, this weather is amazing. But I was eating a, a lobster roll because I like those little lobster rolls. Yeah, you do. And a naked dude jumped the fence. How naked? Like butt ass naked. Oh, no shoes. And grabbed somebody's like lobster roll and took off running. And then a, a helicopter was tracking them. Right. There was like cops that showed up, EMS, like a whole, and Over there's a families, lobster there's roll? kids everywhere. Over a lobster say, roll. I'm just thinking about the, Over a lobster the roll. actual cost to taxpayer dollars for this lobster theft. Yeah. <laughs> what do you think just comes over? Grab. What do you think comes over the radio to the helos? Like, listen, we got a naked guy, <laughs> a hopping fence stealing lobster rolls. <laughs> It's spin the blades. Let's go. Let's get on That's this guy. That's expensive. That's it's like expensive. a misdemeanor at if a minimum. If you were on the receiving end of that call, would you believe it was real? No, but I would absolutely spin the what blades. What if it was your lobster Fuck yeah, let's go get that naked guy. 
Would you have defended your life if that was your lobster roll? Yeah. yeah. I would have, dude, oh, I, yeah. my, like food for me, yeah, I'm yeah. a gifter and share, but if yeah. somebody just snatched shit off my plate. You guys aren't thinking about this right. The man was nude. So you yeah. really want to get into it with a nude man over a lobster roll? Yeah, yeah. Only if he has an erection. <laughs> because then you would just I want the, this to yeah. be an intimate experience. For I'm being serious right now. <laughs> Make a straight face. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Naked people doing crazy That's, shit. I will let them do that. I'm not getting involved. In no, that. no, I, I, I'm not getting involved with because you know what's on board there. Like all the heps, like the the hep rainbow. You know the, yep. the, the the this is like fentanyl and crack mm-hmm. and everything else. That they, like how much shit do they got on board and how many different weird diseases? All of them. All just we'll just call them all. Yeah. So yeah. You, like there's mm-hmm. not there's not a lot of mu- there's not a lot of like pushback from my from my perspective. I had a guy in front of my house a few years ago. I used to live right across the street from Liberty Park downtown, and um, he was naked with a tennis racket, just like walking down the sidewalk. There's a level of crazy when the clothes come off. Yeah, it, it, in yeah. my mind, it's with the clothes on, I will tolerate much less. Clothes off, it's like I'm yeah I'm out. I'm yeah. out. I was I actually went outside. I used to have this little MPX that I'd put next to the door because it was kind of a shady little neighborhood. And uh, I went outside and just had it right behind me. I was like, hey, bro, you headed to Wimbledon? He didn't respond for some reason. <laughs> yeah. I, I thought it was hilarious. There is I thought it was super funny. A better than not chance he didn't understand the reference. I don't know if he could uh, understand English, how high he was, but he was definitely in... This is Salt Lake City? Yeah, yeah. Right across mm-hmm. from Liberty Park in Salt Lake City. That's like, why I don't live there. That was all, that was all the time. Like, yeah. The... Liberty Park downtown, Pioneer Park, they used to have a really significant drug and homeless problem. Yeah. So you'd see the whole, oh, all the things that go along with that. You know, all the fun, the fun and flavor that goes along with that. And my daughter and I used to, I used to take her out there and she would ride her bike around the park with me and we'd cruise around. And then one day uh, we were out there and we were playing and like, they used to have like, but they still do big rock sculptures and bushes and stuff. And uh, she's like, "Oh, a bunch of balloons!" And I was like, "Don't touch them! <laughs> Don't touch them!" Oh God! Don't touch those balloons! You know, because she's like, "There's a bunch of little balloons laying around." Uh, and I was like, "Ah, let's not play in this area." We'll, did we'll, Salt Lake City clean it up? They do. I think what happens is it, it kind of ebbs and flows, right? So they've got to push, and it, it's it's kind of like once you have a a an object of mass that you can't really distribute any of the mass. You just kind of push it from here to there, right? It's like being, it's, it's like sweeping your floor without a dustpan. It's just like push it over here and then you push it over there and you push it over here. So perhaps to go through a park, they'll push them out. They'll go somewhere else, build a tent village uh, somewhere else. I, I don't, I don't know exactly where they always go. They kind of just kind of rotate around. Seasonal because of the weather. They're probably going to have to go indoors in the winter months. The reason I asked is I was just in LA. Mm -hmm. And well, and your comment about people acting in that way, it was all over the place. It was all over. It was, well, I can't say it was all over, but there was very densely populated areas where Mm -hmm. it's at a point that I don't know that it could be fixed. Because I hear people talking about the homeless problem in, well, Southern California specifically, because the weather's awesome. Even Perfect. where I grew up in uh, Santa Cruz, there's huge, and I mean huge encampments. And by encampment, I'm talking structures, almost like a, the economy, like there's stuff parceled out. They're not going anywhere. Right. And once it gets to that level, mm. how do you fix that? Like, I don't know how you unwind that once it gets I, to that tipping point. I don't know. I, I think, and I've been trying to figure out, not, I haven't like spent a significant amount of time unpacking this, but it, we might as well talk about things that we don't really know a lot about, as if we do. I yeah. think that's pretty. That pretending's fun. That, that, that pretending's great. Have. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. Uh, that's America. You know, that's that's <laughs> it's America. Let's, let's talk about things we don't understand yeah. with very Make passionate. Some shit up. <laughs> you know, always wrong, never in doubt. That's what I like to say. Um, <laughs> that is actually an. Spectacular T-shirt and bumper sticker. <laughs> Always <laughs> wrong, write, never write in that doubt. Down right now, living like that on my million dollar idea. Right? <laughs> um, but what I, I was thinking about this because there was this uh, documentary or docu series, not a documentary, and who knows how how uh, you know dramatized it was, but it was about 
the opioid crisis and how the pharmaceutical industry that was responsible for that is like Purdue, I believe. And they, they settled for billions of dollars, but how- Which is a fraction of what they actually- Fraction, fra- oh, fra- yeah. fraction of a fraction of a fraction, right? They're, these motherfuckers aren't going to starve. They're, they're like, yeah. oh, yeah. I, oh my God, I, I got to pay all this money. Yeah, you, you made like 30. So you still have like 28 billion left in your Swiss yeah. bank accounts. And I kept thinking about it because- I could not get it out of my mind where there was an opioid that was proven to be harmful. And I'm not discouraging everybody because there are people that need them at times, right? But they were pushing them so hard through their drug reps and marketing. And then they built this entire network and system around nonprofits and false information. And and then they were addicting people. Mm -hmm. Knowing it was addictive. yeah, Knowing it was addictive and they were convicted of this. So in my mind, you would think, wouldn't you have to take all that back? Like if, if the entirety of your business model is built on a, a falsehood or false pretenses, wouldn't you have to take that back? But I've, I've always struggled with trying to figure out why the homeless issue is so significant. And I think it's significantly worse now that I'm an adult because you guys grew up in these places mm. like, we never saw homeless people, man. There's like a homeless guy where I grew up. One dude. One dude. Exactly the same thing. He pushed a shopping cart down the same pathway yep. that I yeah. would see him all the time. Wool trench coat, likely. Yeah. We, we, same dude. Same dude. Yeah. And now there's like three, I think the top 10, three San Jose, Los Angeles, San Francisco are the largest populations outside of New York. Of right. Homeless. But it has to trend line with policy. The opioid. And, yeah. Policy and weather the, too, though. Yeah, for sure. That's why everybody migrates. This. I mean, if you want to be homeless in Montana, you need to go to a sporting goods store. Right. Because yeah. you, will, you will die yeah. in the winter. You'll get eaten by After something, yeah. someone. A lot of the things that would eat you are also sleeping, though. Right, that's fair. In the winter, you're yeah. not, yeah. What's well, the same here? It gets really fucking cold. That's what I'm saying. Well, you, they, they move around, and then I mm. think they'll land in places. I think the policies, though, yeah. of... Um, I've heard a variety, everything from put them into hotels, um, as much support as necessary. You can camp wherever you want to, and we're not going to, and I think that's what's getting people, Joe was talking about it in Austin. They used to have a policy where you couldn't ask them to move. They could camp wherever they want to. Yeah, it's, it's Austin, domicile. Yeah. I think Austin unwound that though, and he was mm. saying that it had made a huge difference. But the volume of people, when we were driving, I wasn't looking at the odometer, but I would guesstimate one to two miles stretch both sides with no more than four feet in between tents, piles. Oh, oh yeah. Miles. That's not good. No, but I, I, what I was thinking about was the trend line directly associated with opioid abuse and prescription in the United States. I wonder if that is correlated directly 100%. with homelessness. Yes, addiction. I mean, Probably. most of them are on the streets because of addiction. So yeah. they're addicted to something. Something. And then they move into yeah. other things. Yeah. Like and then their life is controlled or, by that addiction. Because yeah. yeah. I, I think the lion's share of it is, is addiction and uh, mental health, right? Yeah. And the, sometimes yeah. those things go hand in hand. But it's a classic pairing. Mm-hmm. Addiction and mental health. Because it's... It's it's strange to me that the cities or the municipalities are so, I guess, incompetent in understanding the problem because we 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 see it all the time are they, here. Are they? I, I think they are because I they're like they we we're just need to problem. build more structures so we can house more homeless people, and you're like, or or like you could go out and figure out exactly who they are. I think because they understand the problem and I think that they're using it. I think that they know that the solutions that they propose mm-hmm. are probably a long term strategy mm-hmm. for defeat, right. but it'll get them reelected. Well, that's most of the rhetoric. So, what would you say is the most violent city in the US? What would your guys' guess be? The most violent would probably be uh, Chicago. I, would, I think that's my uh, guess too. I think the people in leadership in Chicago completely understand the level of violence. Right. And I think they probably understand the steps that they could take that might actually decrease that. And my uh, non-professional, not educated in that 
world opinion would be it's not defunding the police. It's actually having more law enforcement around. Yeah. That's not the path that they're taking. And I don't think that's an accident. I think the people in charge know what it is that they're doing, but I think that they're telling time in a matter of seconds as opposed mm-hmm. to days, months, years in long-term approach. Because yeah. it gets them reelected. Right. Because yeah, you could fix the problem. I mean, it's, a, it's, it's very, there's a lot of metrics, a lot of data, and it could be very analytical as like your deliberate approach to fixing that. Should the neighborhood of Austin in Chicago, um, well, the Chicago crime rate across the global war on terror in its worst years, which were the weird years that we fought in it, there were more people killed in Chicago than there were in Iraq in combat. And, and, and when you look at that, that metric, you're like, oh, there's like a, there's a website called uh, something jackass. I mean, it's Googleable, right? right? It tracks all the data from every person who's shot and killed, even where they're shot on their body really? and killed in Chicago. And it, that would be a fascinating read. Dude, yeah, it's yeah. amazing. It's an amazing, it's an amazing data hub for showing what's wrong with inner city America where nobody's paying attention. Right. And you know, I post on it periodically where I'm like, guys, we're talking about a mass shooting where three people were killed and it's in, in narratives and being, you know, boasted and amplified because it fits the narrative. Right. And you got seven people at the same time period last night that were killed, that were murdered, right. that were all black. Right. And it was all black on black crime, but nobody wants to go there. And it, it, that, the whole racial thing um, is, is, again, that policy-driven mindset where we have to keep the same narrative. Because it se- if it seems like we're struggling always, right. then there's always a reason to, to resurge the network. Like, oh, you got a bad team. You got a new commander who's coming in. That new commander is going to save the world. He gets, he gets put in that position. He makes some changes, shuffles some shit around, leaves, and then the team's still screwed up, right. right? And the only way to fix that is like an informal leadership approach where somebody on the team goes, what the fuck are we doing? Right. And then fixes it internally. But politicians are just that, that commander or that temporary leadership who's looking for that OER bullet. I don't mean to associate with just officers. It's just a problem. What does OER mean? Uh, officer uh, evaluation report. So they're like looking for the, call the headline. Fit rep. Yeah. Fitness reports. Has nothing to do with your fitness though, just for clarity. Oh, is that the Navy version of yeah, it? Fit rep. Mm-hmm. It's good. But it's interesting and ironic that the Navy would call that a fitness report because there's only like one group of people in the Navy that are semi-fit. Yeah, the boat guys, right? The yeah, boat the boat guys, guys the special yeah, boat guys. An argument they're can be made that there's, an argument can be made that there's zero groups in the Navy that are truly fit. <laughs> I know some, I know some SEALs that are pushing PSI on their belt. <laughs> Hard PSI. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you get away with that? Yeah, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Really? Of course, because you know exactly I, what yeah. it's tied to. A rank. Mm, <laughs> I've yeah. seen it a few times. I've seen a couple of chubby seals, and that's not normal. Yeah. I Sorry. mean, hey, green beignets are real too. All right, meal team six. Hey, buddy, fucking gravy <clears throat> seals. That shit's gravy real. seals. Slow yeah. and fat. SF. Yeah. It's, a, it's slow and fat. I've seen a few Just of those call guys. Them yeah. What I do? Green yeah. beignets. All right. <laughs> what? It, it, it's and it's always interesting. Like I, I was cruising around some SF forums the other day. Uh, Where are you? Yeah, I because like trolling. Were you leaving I, comments? No, no, I, mean, I wasn't trolling. I was, I was just like talking to guys because they were talking about you know my some you know misinformation out there, and I was like, hey guys, I'm in this group. I've been here. That's since so like, unhealthy. Though. I've been here for since like 2000. Five in this. They didn't group. know you were in the group. No, and I was like, hey, I'm right <laughs> here. That's actually the best. Right that's the you best guys want to ask me yeah. shit? Like I'm right here. You know, and, I started uh, this group, guys. I'm right here. I'm like, I'm in That's the group. Awesome. There's only like, five, like if you guys want to ask me some shit, like go for it. Like yeah. let's fire it up, you know. Yeah. Like, and uh, and it's kind of funny because like I saw a couple of the guys commenting, and I was like, I. It's so funny. Like I, I don't want to like discredit anyone, but I'll just say what the fuck I think. It's like yeah. motherfucker. Like, you didn't carry a fucking gun in combat. Like, shut the fuck up. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. like, it's like, dude, what are you talking about? That's the start point to have a place at the table. Yeah, like, like yeah. maybe it's timing, right? I get it. Like, I get it. But it's like, man, you sh- you don't rate. Like, I, it's you don't rate in the in this in this community if you're gonna like run your fucking suck and yeah. you don't have a fucking CIB. Yeah, like I'll listen to you if you've been fucking in the box a ton of times. I'll be like, fucking hey man, yeah. like if you got years a decade open, of war, I got yeah. fucking respect for you. But yeah. dude, come on man, twenty years of war. Yeah, and you've been ducking in the fucking mommy's basement or where the fuck you been? Like, come on, dude, like that that ain't cool. Like if you got a green beret in your head and you were 
there was no reason you weren't physically qualified to rotate into the box in the last 20 years and you just magically don't have shit. There's a reason. Ah, yeah, that's yeah. deliberate. Ah, come on, man. Yeah. You know, like, you, come on. Question you know? for you guys about the uh, Green Bray community. Do you find, so there's online communities for SEALs. Yeah, well. yeah, yeah. And in the SEAL community, active duty, there's a lot of talk about uh, the brotherhood, right? Mm-hmm. Or uh, the enlisted mafia, which is, Actually, something there you I go. completely yeah, support because yeah. I was yeah, part yeah. of it. And it yeah. actually is how the sausage is made. Right. You get out and you do something that is public. Yeah. With the best of your intentions. Do you guys find, and obviously this would be anecdotal off your personal experience. Do you find the community at large to be supportive or do they t- generally take a negative approach to people having success beyond that community mm. in a public spotlight? Because from the SEAL community... I don't want to say that it's that it's oftentimes negative, but goddamn, it it feels like that a lot. It's almost as if you find success beyond and have any association mm. or link to the community that you came from. It's just like mm. fuck that guy. Mm. What, what, and that might be a slight. No, no. I, I think it's a, a. I think it's a common human thing, right? It's like jealousy, envy, and greed, right? Mm. Those are like the three driving factors. And I think we, you and I yeah. talked about yeah. that. But we, we heard it. And if you think back to when you were in, you would hear it and you can hear the same type of chatter because guys would be like, well, fuck that guy. Why did he get a halo slot? Or fuck that guy. Why did he get that, you know, that gig or he's what there, he's going to be sheep dipped or like, and guys would be like, fuck that guy. Like that self-serving, like, and you're like, there's a lot of fucking halo slots, man. Like, it's not like this is going to be the last one to ever come around, but they went, instead of being like, dude, that's rad. Yeah. You're going like, you got a slot that's epic. Good some for you. Let's go. Some, 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 some people. I'm going to say it's, it's a rare. smaller piece. Of rare. The small. Yeah. It, it was almost like there's, they're so competitive, even, you know, you can speak to it way better than I can, but between, you know, ODAs and companies, you know, battalions and then group, but then they're competitive even inside the ODA because it'd be like, I can't fucking believe like, you can give that to Charlie, you know, or whatever, whatever thing. And then instead of like, and that's actually to the detriment of the entire regimental psychology that they are teaching people to celebrate the success for one another because they have to start that really early. Instead of trying to mud suck and motherfuck and put people down, they need to start to figure out how to rebuild positive psychology early because once you're through the fucking grinder and on the team, should be about let's fucking go. Like one team, one fight, big successful mission, celebrate each other. And then the guys with that attitude, they got to start flushing them out of the fucking toilet because those are the guys that carry the fucking charter forward and they become a star major or wherever. And they directly contribute to an overall negative psychology. And I keep telling people this all the time. It's like psychology is more infectious than fucking the flu or, you know, or the moronic strain or whatever the fuck it is now. But it's like, you can grind people into moon dust when you're trying to figure out whether or not they're going to be on the team. But then after, you kind of got to say like, guys, we're, we're, we're fucking moving in one direction. I, I don't know if you, you, you have a wide variety of experience yeah. in the military. I fired, a, the only guys that I have fired in my career were toxic guys that likely in the same way that a guy got a, a sniper slot or right. won a sniper comp and they were envious and jealous that are the same guys who are naysayers against guys who are stepping outside, which I think stepping outside the military is a, is the true singleton mission that we all wanted. Right. But you never really got, and then you get out because you have so many opportunities and so much navigation for like this mission set. It's like, you could do whatever the fuck you want. You don't have no constraint and guys, because they conform to that pattern of life where they're comfortable, they're in routines. They think they're a singleton. Right. Until they hit the civilian world. And so what they'll do is just put down everybody who's successful, who's, who's adapting to that environment and then succeeding. They'll, they'll be the GS employee for another 20 year round. They'll be the tactical instructor teaching 20 year, more years on a flat range. And they'll naysay and talk shit about everybody around them. And that's the thing 
that I think we can't, like you said, it's behavior. We won't get away from it. But I do feel like that from my, just from talking to guys, like I get feedback where guys are like, you guys are doing awesome shit. Or guys from the regiment talking to me and saying, hey, you know, I'm an active duty third group guy, yeah, unit yeah. guy, whatever it is. And that's, that's good affirmation. But I have heard from the SEAL community about, especially guys from Damn Neck, guys who have stepped outside the box where they're like, fuck that guy. Yeah. What? That dude's like an, a fucking amazing dude. Like Andy, <laughs> Andy Stump's like a great guy. Um, like you're talking shit about him and I get it every day. Like dude's talking shit about Andy every day. Every day. 10 times like, a day. 10 times a day. I got fair. guys I'm like, coming boom, in. Boom. That's fair. <laughs> it's very likely I did too. <laughs> Actually, you know what's funny is I've never had anybody, either one of you, I've never had anybody talk shit about either one of you. Which oh, is, I can give you names. Strange. I'll, yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll do it. Oh yeah, give me that list. Surprising. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like I've had people. I'm shocked to hear that. Yeah. <laughs> shocking. Yeah. Yeah. So shocking. Like, and the reason I, I ask is that it, uh, like, I couldn't be more proud of my military career, but you get, you hear enough of that or you see enough of it. And most of the time, actually, all of the time that I've kind of watched it from a distance on the, on the online portals, which is a conversation in and of itself, I think my life would be better to turn a lot of that shit off. A hundred percent. It makes me want to not turn my back on that community, but it's disheartening because I'm so proud of that. But it's like, hey, um, Guys, I got to move on, and I can't. Behind me, and yeah. I can't actually yeah. pay attention to what you're saying anymore. Yeah, and that really sucks because I wish that I could. Right, but you're acting like fucking children. Yeah, but it, you were all. I mean, we were all in our twenties mm. at the prime in special operations. I mean, I was a 30, 29 year old team sergeant. That's sick. I was a it's fucking awesome thirty two year old sergeant major. So right. I was like, you know, th- that that life, dude. I was fucking retarded. Yeah, like yeah. I, when I look at my 20s as a young, like a salter in the SIF or right. a young SF guy, dude, I was just a, like I used to do a whole bunch of dumb shit that I look back on and go. Really? Yeah. Dude, I was so squared away. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I always made the right decision. So yeah. professional. Tactics were on point. Yeah. I never got emotionally involved God. in anything. No. It was just, I mean, I don't know if there have been textbooks written about it, but there should be. <laughs> it's dude. called extreme ownership. Well, Jocko Dude. can write all that he wants. I yeah. take an extremely limited ownership <laughs> in my 20s. No, I was a fuck show. Dumb. <laughs> Dumb as shit. So all those guys, I think a lot of those guys, you won't really find a lot of guys our age right. with our experience that are talking shit. No. Especially if you spend some time in civilian life. Yeah. You're like, dude, it's fucking hard. The, the, a huge majority of the guys that I know, like, I, I don't spend a lot of time like around like regimental affiliations stuff. I mean, I, I'll do like a couple of events a year in the context of like raising money or talking yeah. to special force association or whatever. And like the broad percentage of guys are super positive uh, because we're typically donating money, right? As yeah. well. Yeah. Um, and, but I don't hear it. I'm sure they're, I'm sure they talk all kinds of shit. I just don't hear it. I mean, maybe, maybe not. I don't know. I mean, at the end of the day, it's like, you know, you got to turn the volume down on that shit. Like squelch is on the radio for a reason, right? It's like, you got to just turn it off. And the message that I always give people in this context and not that I'm giving it to you guys in any stretch of the imagination, I'm just saying like, that was a chapter of my life that yeah, I'm super proud of. And I love a ton of those guys. I love the community because I think it teaches you so much about yourself. If you are fortunate enough to be introspective and then keep those lessons learned and then continue to evolve. But I think there are a lot of guys that use it as an excuse to say, I got the trophy. I'm great. And it says it on my shoulder. It says special. I'm special. It's like, yeah, you, you passed yeah. a course, you got a tab, yeah. you, you, you did some really cool shit, but actually the rest of your life, can't be defined by that one fucking moment. Mm. And like, that's great, dude. You, you got a V device, but are you a good dad? Are you a good mm. partner? Are you a good fucking, you know, business owner? Are you part of your community? Like, that's cool. But that was three and a half minutes of your life. And if you're going to let that define the rest of the years, like, man, you, you, and a lot of guys, and I guess I'm, re, I'm, I'm re- rewinding in that context is that, like, they're like, they let the hat, or the patch, or the trident, or whatever, define yeah. all of their life. Yeah, and it's like, 
dude, you got a lot of life to live, man. You you can create these epic moments and galvanize relationships and build yourself outside of that. Like you don't have to let that be your last thing and you don't have to continue to like throw it back in people's face. Like, yeah, bro. I, I, I met this guy. I won't go on too many rants. I'm highly caffeinated, but I met this dude one time and I ended up f- fucking loving this guy. He was awesome. But when I first met him, I thought he was the, well, I'm confusing two people. But the, the one guy, which I'll tell you. So I go into this bar. We had a bar in Kabul, which I think is, everybody knows about at this point. It's like, yeah. <laughs> like the agency had this bar that, and everybody would come in and this dude comes in. He's wearing like snakeskin boots, like cowboy boots, shit kickers in Kabul, right? Like slick bottom cowboy boots. He's got a belt buckle the size of this table, this fucking table, like a frying pan. I feel like you would be wearing that though. I, don't, I would I, love I, to wear it now because it'd be like an irony. I yeah. do, I do tons of shit in irony. I love it. <laughs> and it's got a fucking trident on it Ugh. in the middle of it that's like bigger than my fist. Ooh. Oh, yeah. it gets better, boys. We call that low vis. It gets better. <laughs> <laughs> and then he has a ring. Uh, that looks like a rapper's, like one of those like old school yeah. rapper rings. It's so fucking big. And he's got another trident on it. Oh. Snakeskin boots, snakeskin belt, snakeskin holster, snakeskin magazine pouches. Like, yo, dude, this guy was dressed for like the tactical club. Like he was going to fucking like come in and like, he, he it, either way. I cannot say this guy's name because he might still actually work there. <laughs> and, uh, so I go up to him and, you know, I don't know if you guys know this, but I'm somewhat of a troll. And uh, I go up to him and I was like, what's up, man? What's going on? He's like, what's up with you, man? I was like, <laughs> so were you an SF or what? what's up? He's like, I was a team guy. And I was like, like an SF, right? He's like, no, man. <laughs> and I'm like, and this dude doesn't know that I'm fucking with him. I'm like, dude, of course I know you're a Navy SEAL. You're basically like with a fucking belt buckle and the ring and the fucking cowboy boots. And like, dude, want, come dude. on, man. Look good. Look good. Oh, this guy looked good. Like, Was he an uh, agency guy? Good. Yeah, yeah, mm. yeah, 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 yeah. I- I'll tell you who it is afterwards. You'll know exactly who it is. Oh, man. And, uh, it was awesome because that I'm not awesome. fucking around about the size of these things. They were massive. And it was that standard like roper type belt buckle, like yep. a cowboy belt buckle that was huge. And it was silver with the gold trident <laughs> in the center of it yeah. and the same matching ring. And this dude was wearing cowboy boots and snakeskin everything. I'm like, I'm not seeing the this is awesome. Before. That's like second phase gear issue. <laughs> yeah. I don't know when you guys issue <laughs> that stuff, but it's like, here's your NVGs and here's your belt buckle. There you go. <laughs> the publishers will come meet you. <laughs> oh. No, it was awesome. Speaking of squelch on the radio, you uh, reminded me of one of my favorite things. As a hypothetical, did you guys ever run around on Target and turn people's radios down or off? I was a comma guy. I, I was a comma guy. I wouldn't think that was I have, I've had that experience. All right. I'm just curious. I would, so dump, their, I I would dump their crypto. That's what I would. <laughs> I'm not saying that I have. I'm just saying, <laughs> how awesome would that be? Just, <laughs> I would dump crypto all the time on guys. Because I was like, because they would fucking come to me and be like, hey, can you load my radio? I'm like, are you oh, yeah. like 10 years old? Dude, but do you not know how to use a yeah. fucking kick 13? So I'd say, yeah, no problem. And if they're rolling crypto like in an hour or whatever, I'd just dump it and be like, yeah, yeah fuck off. Like, piss off, loser. Get out of here. <laughs> my first role was as a calm guy and I thought I had lost kick 13 one time. Oh, man. Oh, that's so, so scary, bro. Do do? It is like, that scares me. Oh, right now. Even you yeah, it makes saying you, that, makes it makes me sweat. Yeah, it makes you describe what we're talking about. It's a very small device that you can lose in a fucking couch. Do they still use them? <laughs> yeah. Kick uh, they have like KYZ 1000s now, I think. That hold yeah. even well, more they have the crypto. Crazy 10. Crazy 10. That's yeah, right. Yeah, the Crazy 10. Yeah. Bottom line is yeah. the Kick 13 is smaller than this can of- It's tiny. Yeah. And it's quad. green. And it's green. <laughs> and if you push the fucking buttons in the wrong sequence, it dumps everything <laughs> it that's in it. But everything. you can load up. Yeah. So on the radios that we talk on, there's- uh, What the hell do we call it? It's not open source. It's- Sheriff. No, just uh, in the open, right? Yeah. In the green. Yeah. Right. Not encrypted. Anybody can yeah, hear yeah. it if you're on the right freak. Yeah. If you're in the red, you're encrypted. God, and there's like, I still remember this shit. The Vincent and A and DBT yeah, crypto yeah, and all that yeah. shit. One, you sound like a robot. One, you sound normal, assuming you have the shit set up. Yeah. Vincent for voice. Just yeah. remember that, boys. <laughs> v for V. 
Advanced narrowband digital voice transmission. <laughs> Holy fuck. Look man, at you, a- <laughs> bro. <laughs> Damn. I thought, I thought it was only commo nerd here. No. And the reason I can remember this shit is I had a fucking two-day panic attack where I couldn't find a kick 13, which could have multiple days, weeks, and I think even if you had the right access months of crypto. And this shit's used by the entire military. Absolutely. You got the entire theater role. Correct. Uh, so if you, you, lose you lose never that, use that? Oh, I did all the time. Uh, yeah. yeah. As a team, as a run the MSS, it scared the shit out of oh, me. Oh, it scared the fucking I had 550 cord out. like wrapped around every so piece that's, of that. That's yeah. what it ended up being. It was 550 cord around the neck, which is not mm-hmm. comfortable. Yep. Yeah. But if you lose this thing, like, like battleships and aircraft carriers have to change their crypto. Yep. Yeah. So there was, at the end of every month, there was an inventory. And let's just say, hypothetically, one month, I came up one short. (laughs) And I I, I just basically cold sweat for days. Oh, yeah, yeah. I found it in the bottom of a pocket of one of my backpacks that I think I may have been, like, taking home. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) That's scary. Yeah. After that, it was 550 cord around the neck. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that's- I would carry two. Terrifying. I carry two. I carry one in my left cargo pocket, one in my right cargo pocket, and I had a five fifty corded to my belt. Mm. And I mean, that was the dumbest fucking thing ever because I was like, "Well, I, I would five fifty it through the loop in the uh, in your flap in your cargo pocket, like yeah. I run the five fifty yep. cord through the loop, and then I tore the edge off of, car- of a fucking cargo pocket. So then I went up." And now you got fucking 550 cord going in there. And then I started carrying them in like my pockets, my front pockets, my fucking cargo pockets. Because <laughs> it was like, I was like deathly afraid of the same thing. Yeah. Well, I was, well, one, every now and again, very, very rarely the kick 13 would dump. Like, and if you let Dum Dum McGillicuddy, like, you know, 18 Charlie fucking touch shit that they don't know what they're doing. Zero it out. Yeah, like, yo, dude, what, what did you, you just do? Like, why, why would you do that, man? <laughs> like, like, wait, I'm going to leave Who one target, that? bro. Like, what are you talking about? And to like, carry one in each pocket. Moving rotary dial yeah. around and hitting both buttons at the same time. <laughs> like, I'm sweating thinking about <laughs> it. So like, bad. it's so bad, man. It was and then you go to the agency. Head, oh, God. And they were like, you'd go in and be like, hey, man, I need an inventory. And they're like, what inventory? What are you talking about? We don't inventory anything here. Well, I need like a full inventory, right? Like, you know, like accountability of our items, our yeah. sensitive items. They're like, you're a loser, weirdo. Like, no, it's so here. weird. What are you talking about? Accountability in the military is so weird though. Yeah, it's like, you guys are your hyper fucking militarized things talking about like where mm-hmm. your NVGs are, where crypto is. You need to get out of here with that. One set of NVGs would be, would shut down like theater operations with somebody lost. Oh bro, pre-9-11, I've spent... Yeah multiple days looking for a pair of MBGs that somebody lost on an operation Yeah, to find out that they never took them on the operation. And <laughs> yeah. It was in their fucking bag the <laughs> entire course. time. So weird. Why is the military weird? Why were, I mean, that is a big a jump or leap from going into the agency where nobody cares about any accountability. Are you it's, serious about that? Oh, I'm dead serious. Oh, you write off everything. Because I have no experience with that organization off from everything. that perspective. No, no accountability on anything. I would go into places and I'd be like, hey, so I, that's what I would, because it would drive me crazy. I have too much organizational aspects. It would drive me crazy. I'd walk into a shipping container in the middle of nowhere and there would be like stacks of ammo with different calibers and they didn't yeah. know how much they had. And they, boxes of nods boxes and of guns and optics. Yeah, they like, like that? Because they were, a lot of the original contractors were team guys. They were SEALs. Yeah. And they, for, and this is my theory and yeah. no offense to your, your former regiment, but. It's going to be offensive. It's going to be offensive. <laughs> I hope so. I'm here for it. I think you guys have, I think you guys have guys that do that for you. Like you have supply people in. No, in- we go to supply people to get issued that stuff, but there is a fucking custody chain. Oh. Like I was, even though I was at East Coast, I, at one time I was the NVEO, what is that? Night vision equipment and optics department head. I, right. I had a monthly inventory. Like I, there was a bunch of stuff issued to the squadron. And then I would then, I can't remember the name of the piece of paperwork. Uh, 1149 probably off to people and all of that stuff was maintained. And I was the one as an assaulter still responsible for doing that. Tracking hand receipts. Yeah, uh, for sure. Especially if they were getting ready, like we we're going to go over to yeah, yeah. OEF and they were going to be disaggregate. Like I'm making boxes for them and I would sit down with the team mm. and they're like, here's your inventory. And then it becomes their responsibility. So there was always that, I mean, there is a robust, uh, robust support network, but. Right. I mean, to me, it was hammered in my head. One of the fastest ways 
two ways I could basically detonate my career, alcohol related incident and losing serialized inventory oh, yeah, yeah. in a, like a non-combat environment. Right. Just like, mm, yeah, yeah, that box of uh, nods fell off right. the training, uh, the truck of the training trip, like you're done. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's fair. I don't know. I think it's because it's a civilian organization. And then the original, I think sometimes they, they got blamed for it because the original crew that they hired in back in the day was like, there's like all Cops and guys. Seals. Yeah, yeah. In, so and I, the best. The but best. then you had like <laughs> civilians that were running it and they just, you know, they just don't know. Like they, they don't know what they don't know. And I mean, it was run so fucking loosey goosey. At times you'd be like, I remember one time I was, I was talking to one of my buddies and um, I was like, where, where, where have you been? He's like, dude, I flew out to this like Sinjar or Telefar or wherever the fuck he was out in the middle of nowhere. There's like a shipping container with an antenna out in the middle of fucking nowhere. I fly out there and the, to, to drop off a, a maintenance guy. And the maintenance guy was doing his thing and they, they were bringing another guy out. So me and this guy gets back on the bird. I'm waiting for the next guy. Three days go by. I don't have anything. I don't have a radio. I'm just down in the middle of a <laughs> desert. Of course. And they forgot about this dude. <laughs> and he's like, because they were supposed to be coming right back. And he's like, no radio, no phone, nothing. Like, they're like, oh, don't worry about it. Like, you know, you're, you're on the ring route. Like, don't worry about it. We'll, we'll get you. It's like three days went by. He's like, I didn't have any food. I was like, I had one MRE and then they fucking finally showed up out, out of like three days. And they're like, holy fuck. Oh, we thought you went back. And they're like, no, what are you talking about? Like you guys aren't running like manifests and like- No, no processes. Oh my God. No operational yeah, processes. Yeah, three days. He's yeah. like, I was out in the middle of nowhere for three fucking days with no comms, like trying to figure out how the fuck I was going to even get out of here. He's like, I thought maybe the bird went down and like now nobody knows who was on the fucking bird or whatever. He's like, nothing. They're supposed to be right back. They just went back and they're like, well, Dan, let's get some coffee. <laughs> Are we supposed to do something? No, oh, I can't remember anything. You, Eric? Nope. Oh, fuck it. I don't let's know. Let's go eat chow. Bar. Let's go eat chow. Let's go. Yeah. It was so, like those early years in, uh, those early years in Iraq were fucking, they were fucking Looney Tunes. Because were you, you in the- they fix it? Yeah. Done. So good. Fix it so, <laughs> fix it so hard. <laughs> you fixed it so hard. <laughs> That's what I thought. So it's just the same guy. <laughs> like, yeah. Because were you on? Were you on the original invasion of Iraq? Yeah. Yeah. Where'd you guys come in from? R R A R A R Saudi Arabia. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Were you on the initial? No, I wasn't. The I was in the Q course. Fucking you guys. Uh, during the invasion, you missed guy. it all. I was Dude. in selection during Afghan's invasion. Yeah. And then I was in the Q course during uh, Iraq. Don't worry. Some Chomping of us, up the bit, man. Some of us held down. You I know. But you got the, you got the fucking Mike. spicy portion of the war. The fucking yeah. invasion was like a, it was like the cannonball run. I mean, it was yeah. just like, yeah. Like I got cannonball four, run with a little bit of fucking, four, five, five six, seven, hot. eight, nine, ten, but six, seven, and eight were, that was the glory years. Ugh. That, that was, was peak kinetic years. Yeah. Peak. No. Task Force 16, McChrystal's machine. I got uh, three of those rotations. Mm. Amazing. Uh, uh, one of the squadrons was there, but I remember looking at those dudes and thinking to myself, like, holy shit, like, these are Vikings. Like, these yeah. dudes, I was talking to, to DJ about it, but my impression of those units, even being a young assaulter in the, in the SIF, I was like, they get to wear fucking beards down to their, like, their yeah, fucking yeah. body armor. Yeah, yeah. And their fucking, all their shit was cut. All their sleeves were cut. Yeah. Yep. And they go into the gym and just beat the fuck out of bags and lift weights and shit. Then get on the bird and go kill. And I was like, oh, yeah. It doesn't get better than this, man. Right. It was awesome. That was you. Did you have a giant beard? No, I'm not. I could only grow an Abraham Lincoln beard. <laughs> did, you alias, cut, did you cut your sleeves off? name would be Habish. Did you cut your sleeves off? <laughs> your sleeves were cut though. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah 100% yeah. cut off. Sexy yeah. cut. Yeah. They wouldn't let you guys cut your sleeves off? No, I mean, eventually. I did, did some weird shit though back then. Like, there's pictures of me where I'm doing some weird shit. Again, back to unprofessionalism. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm wearing, in one picture, I'm, this is with Task Force. I'm wearing a, uh, uh, Australian top. Yeah. With ACU bottoms. That's not a bad idea though. It's, it's not. a mix and match. Because I, I thought like the Australian top had the shirt integrated into it because we're just, 
we were like hand sewing that because yeah, it wasn't yeah, available yeah. from Cry. Right. Um, we were taking DCUs and attaching them to t-shirts like with the local sewer. So that was good for body armor. Oh, yeah. And so I'd have, but I'd go around in garrison doing planning and whatever we were doing, just looking like a, like a dumbass. Yeah. You know, and the unit had, they had their sexy cry. Yeah. Original AR1, whatever. $800 top and bottom. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then the Ranger Regiment had ACUs. They just got yeah. ACUs. And then we were just wearing some janky shit. It's weird. Janky. Janky shit. Stepchildren, man. That's kind of like the whole thing, though. It's like when you, your uniform is just your uniform. It was like, eh, nobody cares. Who cares? Nobody gave a fuck. Nobody right cares. Then. The only priority was killing people. Yeah. Like, I mean, I was telling somebody the other day, I was like, yeah, I mean, I used to wear a fucking burka in the back of a goddamn car all the time yeah. because I am smaller. Yeah. And it made sense. You can't have a person your size, especially if you're going to get out of the street. Yeah. <laughs> you can't have like, a person your bitch? size yeah. wearing that. It doesn't make sense. So I oftentimes got that. That's what I got. You know, I mean, it is what it is. But by a few seconds at least on the street. Well, on the car, you know, if you're doing like, like low vis, like it was always in the back of the car. So I've been yeah. in the back of the car with the fucking saw, you know, a little parasaw, a couple nut sacks, a couple frags. I used to run like, the yeah, I'm the chick being driven around by these fucking dudes. That's the way it goes. <laughs> yeah. The Rangers, I had the Rangers, the, the coolest ops that I was doing was in uh, Afghanistan, but I had one of my Afghan partner unit guys, like a tier one Afghan, trained by Ranger Regiment. Um, I would drive looking all nervous, standing out like an you do, Afghan. Yeah. You look great. And I just like slump my shoulders and sink into my man yeah. jams. <clears throat> and then I had two- Did you Smoke? Did you oh, yeah. Say, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. It yeah. was pine. Like, <laughs> what? Those, like garbage. Oh, God, dude. You could blow into like a napkin and just black tar. <laughs> it's fucking disgusting. Um, I had a two ranger regiment because um, they run snipes. They have a snipe section and a recce section. Right. So I'd run the recce guys in burkas on- was it tough book CF nineteen? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah the C yeah. old CF nineteens. Probably Falcon View. Falcon yeah. View, little Falcon it was on, View. They were on Falcon she View. She was so fun. <laughs> Navin. We, we remember when that shit came out. Commodore like, two thousand, like a fucking. That, oh, that was like the best. It was like Atari. Like, oh my god. It was the Atari first, days. Like, moving maps. Yeah. Like, oh my god. Dude. Oh my god. It's the latency and delay of that oh, shit yeah. was just grotesque. No, grotesque. I never missed a corner because of it. Yeah, yeah. You definitely didn't. <laughs> never, <laughs> never, never. And then uh, a ranger private in the backpack with, with a saw machine gun just ready to break doors and Is that an motion E4? down. E4, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, E4. Uh, can we talk about the media thing? Can I kick, can we talk one? about that a little bit? Oh, like, like the, the disconnect? Media, like, Not like the whole thing, yeah, yeah, but can yeah, we talk yeah. a little that bit about it? Yeah, yeah. Fucking drastic break from what we were talking about. I know, about but I, like, I have to trans. I'm excited about Mike it. Mike is so excited about this and so am I. Yes. Like, I think we're all excited about it, which is like- I have a- I'll, I'll tee it up. I'll tee it up. I'll tee it up. Tee it up. Tee it up. I won't tee it up in any like really good fashion. We're just, we're talking about this the other day where all these people would benefit from the car crash, right? It's like you were talking about it earlier. Politicians are selfish. They're self-driven and they gaslight people with the intent of, of getting them to the voting booth. Mm. So they create these like fictional narratives, which ultimately is also they've also been able to exploit these fictional narratives to cause division in the country by we'll call them like Iran and China and North Korea, all the other strategic enemies. So they're almost working in concert to spin people up and create these like fictional divisions between people and then gaslight and then ignite the fuel on each one of them because their their intent is to divide and then galvanize and then activate the base as they call it, right? So it's basically, they benefit directly from extremism in, in, in any form. When I'm saying that, like left or right or whomever it is. And we were talking about this the other day. We we're like, you know, most people are fairly logical. They're not out there like ready to fucking, you know, go to war over whether or not you want an electric car or not. Like it doesn't really matter. Like, it's not this real division, whereas people get fucking spun up. And then the media has a direct representation in that process too, because they want the eyeballs. So it's always this like continuation of the escalation of information to drive traffic because they need the revenue. 
They need the votes. They need the revenue. They need the uh, hyper-sensationalized event in any regard because that's what our enemy wants. Our real enemies are actually not within the border. It's actually China, Iran, North Korea. Okay, and the people that really need to understand that, I think, are just the general population. They need to understand they directly benefit from dividing the entire country and getting us to fight ourselves. And so they're paying, playing into this. And that, what's that doing is it's directly contributing to the division in the United States. So Mike and I were talking about this. Like, how do we, how do we figure out a way to have just normal conversations with people? And I think that's one of the reasons why Joe has been so successful, by the way, because oh, absolutely. he has yeah. wide variety of conversations with a ton of different people. Yeah. And he's a fairly open-minded guy. So he's getting real information in long form, in, in, in the long form segments. So we were talking about it. We're like, and I'll, I'll hand it over to you. We were talking about in the veteran community, who do we know that has media representation within the veteran community that we typically can speak with, you know, some form of authority. We should probably put something together and figure out how we can at least discuss topics without having this hyper sensationalized bullshit that's like everywhere. Everybody's offended. Everybody's activated. Everybody is fucking hypersensitive to anything. It's like, are they though? Because I, I've been like fucking accused of all kinds of weird ass shit, like being a communist in the last year online or whatever, because I, I, my friend's Tulsi. And two thirds of those are my comments though. Well, yeah, that's true. Yeah. But Nobody's uh, ever it, said yeah. anything. <laughs> Nobody's ever said anything to my face. Dude, I was like, just going to ask. Ever. I was just going to say this to you. I'm not going to derail this, but I'm going to go back to a conversation we had on the phone like a week ago when I was right. planning to come out here. I'm driving home and he calls me. I'm like, what's up, man? And you're like, oh. I'm like you're not following what's going on, which I wasn't at all. And you're yeah. like, oh, I'm back in the trenches. So, of course, I go on the fucking internet to figure out what you're talking yeah. about afterwards. Oh, it was even better. This is how we ended the call. He goes, we were talking and we knew we were going to do this and come podcast and a, some business meeting afterwards. He's like, what I really want for you, what I'd really like is, and then he goes, oh shit, I got to take this other call and hop off and fucking hangs up. It was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> it was like the Ocean's Eleven. Where yeah. was like, Whatever you do, don't. And then somebody gets his attention and walks off. <laughs> so I'm laughing. I'm like, first off, I know he'll never call back because he's busy as fuck, which is fine because we were going to sit down. So I get home and I go into Twitter. Oh, good. Yeah. And yeah, I'm yeah. like, oh mm. my fucking God. And it was all based around the Kyle Rittenhouse verdict. And I'm not even going to get into that topic because I discussed it directly on the podcast and my thoughts and all that. But the more I was thinking about it, I was, think, I was looking at the way people were interacting and I landed on the exact same spot where you, what you just said, and this is why I brought that in there. I've never had conversations with people like that face to face. No. It only, and it actually only happens for whatever reason on Twitter. That seems to be the most toxic. Mm -hmm. Second would probably be YouTube commentary. Right. And then Instagram is a little bit more nerfed when it comes to people mm, engaging right. like that. And I have no idea why that is. But in person, I have never actually met or discussed or talked with anything like that. With anybody, regardless if they're wildly disagree on in every position. It's, right. like, it's like, hey, cool, man. Like, that's not my jam. You do you. I'll do me. Right. There's none of this like, you know. Mm fuck you and fuck everything about you. I hope that you guys get canceled, blah, 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 blah. It's like, first off, A, maybe just don't drink the coffee. Yeah, just, you can just use your dollar, like vote with your Elsewhere. dollar. Mm. But that <clears throat> level of uh, interaction, mm. it, it's, it's very weird. It's really weird. And I think it's, because a lot of it is just direct misinformation. And I've seen a lot of it from, and when I say I've seen a lot of it, like I'll get a summarized, like an in sum, basically. It'll be like, this is what, is published on this on this end or whatever. I'm like, well, the facts were. I literally said, as we like, I've said on both your shows. Actually, it's like, no, I I just didn't feel it was ethically acceptable for in any way for us to profit or even the perception of profiting from this. Yeah. There was never like, oh, I threw him under the bus. I never, I never said that. It's like the judicial system will prevail. It looks to me like he had every right to defend himself, but. It's not ethically acceptable for any company, I think, to profit from this, mm -hmm. which I still think this is 100% accurate, the right position, which and is also, don't profit yeah. from this event. Well, the people who are online who are screaming at you, like you owe yeah. them an apology and all that stuff, 
I think we should be very clear that they've never been in a position where they have to, as a brand, as a global mm-hmm. brand at this point, if you had said nothing, you were mm-hmm. going to alienate a certain portion sure. of fill in the blank. Mm-hmm. If you had said something, which you did, you're going to alienate another portion. So there's mm-hmm. no way that you're getting out of that situation uh, scot-free. None no. of the people who are complaining about this, I think, have any understanding of the gravity of those decisions. Mm-hmm. Because if you remember, you were at my fucking house on the phone with reporters when all of this shit yeah. first went down. Yeah, yeah. And I was sitting there watching you having to deal with that. And I was thinking in my head, hey, you're fucked. You're in a no-win situation. And so after land, like looking through all that Twitter stuff, I was thinking about it. I'm like, oh, let's say there's 100,000 people who are online who are really upset about this. Yeah. Let's focus on the other 330 million, million in people. The US. So my advice You're is exactly turn right. that shit off. And but first off, the name of the company, I don't know if you know this is probably gonna alienate about half the US Correct. population. Yeah, a good 50%. <laughs> so, of it. A good 50%. So there, there's yeah. no there's no way you'll ever change their mind. That's totally no. fine. But it, even if it's a million people that are online screaming that you owe somebody an apology, turn that shit off and let's just focus on actually moving the, the fucking rock down the field because it's wasted energy, man. <laughs> oh, I it's could, so I could hear it in your voice though. You were fucking Right. <laughs> well, it's it wasn't that because I do I turn it off. Yeah. Like I, I turn it off. It was the and it's not even the constant cycle of things. It's hey, there are a, a lot of media outlets that kind of reach out. They want to talk about it or whatever, and you're like, hey, no, no comment. I'm not interested in it. Um, and this is why it's like it's reserved for conversations with people like us because you're from my tribe. And it's like, yeah, it's, it's at the end of the day, it's like, man, I, I don't owe anyone any apology because I didn't seek to profit from this. Like it's not, that's just not acceptable in my mind. It isn't. So, and then the other piece was like, yeah, you're misquoting my fucking intentions or even the story from the New York times all the way around. Yep. Like, so now it's time for you guys to start reading and, and believing everything the New York Times has to say. Like, mm-hmm. and it's like, I've already addressed this stuff even on like Rogan show and I posted stuff on it. It's like, yeah, yeah, I'm not going to talk about it because I, I don't need to. I don't need to talk about it anymore. But I think it's, I think it's interesting from a negativity perspective, the context of people get so spun up and they get bought into just false information all the way around. And then they start spreading additional layers of just false False, false. And then by the time the game of telephone rolls around, you're like, dude, what started this was like all the way over here. And you're talking about this over here. It's yeah. fucking crazy. Um, well, it ties I, into the value of what, you, what your idea was of having a place where you can actually discuss things like that absent the agenda or narrative. You have to. L- let me, so like one- the 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 let's imp- pause before you go into that. You piss? I got a piss. I got piss. And too. I know you got a piss. If I got a piss, you got a piss. A liter. Liter. Isn't that good. Ooh, what is that? That's kind it's of like circus a, bear. Super. Uh, it's like beer. Uh, circus bear. First so off, good. the best blend of coffee you make is the fucking co- podcast blend. You mean your your blend? Oh fuck! It is so good. <laughs> but I give people a warning: like if you make a cold brew with this, you better be sitting on the toilet when you drink it. Yeah. But mm-hmm. that with a pour over, holy shit! That's dude. the mo- you it, have the medium. It, roast, you right? are cleared yeah. hot. Yeah. yeah. You are cleared hot. <laughs> I will do a nice little Chemex brew with that in the morning. <laughs> holy shit, man! You uh, do you clear yourself hot when you do that. So the first time I made cold brew with it, I put it in the steeper, and then a trip came up. So I was gone for three days. Oh yeah. And I came back and I filled up a cup about this size. I was just like, good, good, good. Put it down and just heard. <laughs> I was like, oh God. <laughs> yeah. That will wreck. That will wreck you. Especially because if you used a full bag with another gallon of water. Use an entire bag of yeah, coffee. And steeped it. Yeah. Well, that's the ratio. Use, <laughs> it's, it's, it's uh, 12 ounces or a full ground coffee to a, a gallon. So you use a gallon of water oh. and then you let it steep for 24 hours what are the typically. Bags? What are the common bag sizes? Right yeah. This is the Rambo, which is, is 14. This is 12. Yep. So, so this you, is a gallon of coffee. That's a gallon. So or we ground that up 30 and 30 ounces. It, or 30 ounces. <laughs> and uh okay. I, I do have a quick fucking super funny story. So I was talking to Sly Stallone. And like 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 Rambo. Like Rambo. Rambo. No, I was talking to Rambo, and 
For real. For real. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So I get a text from one of my friends in there and he was like, hey, Sly wants to talk to you. And I was like, <laughs> you fucking with me, right? He's like, no, no, he wants to talk to you. He's been calling you. I gave him, I gave him your number. And I was like, my phone hasn't fucking rung one time. And he's like, he's called you like six times. <laughs> and I'm like, what number did you send him? And he's like, your number. And then he texted me the number. It's like, that's not my number. You're texting. Like, you can look at my number. <laughs> it's not my number. <laughs> oh. So Sly had been calling some other dude like six <laughs> times and like leaving him, <laughs> leaving him messages. Oh. So I call him or, you know, I call him back on FaceTime and he's like, yo, what's up? You know, or whatever. Right? I, I, I don't know. But uh, that dude's still alive. Yeah, man. He's super cool. He's like the coolest of the cool. Really? Yeah, dude. We talked. I talked with Rambo about Rambo for 45 minutes. Like, Is he a fan? Of Rambo? Yeah. No, not this this coffee. But, (laughs) um, dude, it was epic. Because First Blood is, is, you know, I was like, hey, first and foremost, like, I just got to get out there. Like, First Blood is the, the, one of the single most beautiful cinematic treasures we have as, as, as a country, right? And he's like- Perhaps in humanity. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's great. And so we talked about First Blood and we talked and talked. Like he, he, he gave me a ton of really cool information about it because, you know, I have the original painting from the artist that did, it's at my house. Oh, okay. Put that to my house. From <laughs> the First Blood novel. So the guy that did the the-, the painting or the, the artwork, artistry, yeah. the artwork. Um, he had a, an acrylic painting. I, my wife found it on eBay. It was 500 bucks. The odds of that. The odds. She's like, I think this is really cool. And I was like, bitch, hang up the phone <laughs> and buy that <laughs> right now. <laughs> and um, <laughs> How did she randomly found that? Dude, it was random. She was like, I think this the is really cool. Is full of treasures. That's the answer. Was to it I, under Rambo? No. It was. It wasn't. Wow. And it wasn't under any of that. She was just randomly like, "Hey, she's looking for some art." She's like, a "You know, treasure. we don't want it." And I, I, I literally—that's exactly what I said. It's to do with like, the rifle. Yes. Like run up. Ah. Oh. And I and I knew what it was. I knew exactly what it was. She like screenshot it, texted me, and called me, and I was like, "You hang up this fucking phone <laughs> and buy that." It was five hundred. Buy it now. Five hundred bucks. Buy it now. And so then I started going down the rabbit hole on all these other paintings because this, this guy that actually did all the paintings for a bunch of different book covers. Pod- You're trying to find them. Yeah, Jerome Podwell, Podwell was his name. So he has this other painting that I found and it's, so Operation Mongoose was to counter the Soviet intervention in Cuba. Mm-hmm. So he has a painting, it's, on my, it's in my kitchen uh, and it has a USSR rocket being launched into the fucking, you know, the atmosphere with a mongoose on it. And they've got all these like American tanks that are, or American trucks that are running around. As soon as I saw it, I knew exactly what it was. I was like, that's about Operation Mongoose, you know? And uh, so it's like rich in history and he's got a bunch of other wild fucking paintings that are all over the fucking place and they're kind of random. But so I bought a few of these and a lot of these are romance novels that he would paint the romance novels for. And we got a few of them. And if you go to a Black Rifle coffee shop and look for one, they'll be in there. And the reason that they're in there is because Podwill did the artwork for First Blood. And it's a, an homage to like my, my book that I loved so much as a kid. Mm, yeah. I like that. Well, Which what's is so really so kind so of long. a psychopath. Why huh? did he, like, what was the... He just wanted to. He was. He was shoot it, like shoot the shit. Yeah, it was fucking wild, man. Like, and we were just talking about like he. We talked to. I was like, hey, no offense, but the two greatest Rambo's are number one and whichever one you were in Burma. Like, I, I don't. I don't know the. Numbers. That was a good one as well. I was like, you could chop everything else out. Yeah. And he's like, hundred percent. I did both those. <laughs> he's like, and and he was like, yeah, that's why because I had creative control over those two. And these are the way, so like the way that I wanted 
those to be was very specific. I had like most of the creative control over those, but the Rambo series had been sold a couple different times to different companies and he didn't have, he didn't have creative control. So he's like, was, that sucks. didn't have creative control. So I couldn't really do it. But the one in Burma, I got to do, and that was shot in Thailand. It was like the way that he was explaining. That was like, sick. And it was like, like the fifty cal point blank range of like yeah. evaporating dudes' nuggets. I was that like, was that's his real. idea. That's like yeah, really good. He's like, I want to see what this does. And they went and filled like a fucking duffel bag full of meat and like shot it with a fifty cal just to see yeah. what it did. Because he's like, I want, I want this in the show, you know. And I was like, okay, cool, man. Um, yeah, I've had a couple weird, really weird conversations. Like, we're really cool conversations with people. I'm like. I like Ted Nugent called me the other day and uh, like really the Nuge man. I was yeah. like, this is awesome. I was there when he went to Iraq in like 04 or 05, or 05, 05. He went to Iraq for a trip and he was like shooting guns with us and stuff. And they did a fast rope demo for him. Yeah. Cool dude. That's not me ma- name dropping, by the way. I, I'm like yeah. always amazed when, when I like, wow, come on. But the couple years ago, I've told this story a few times before is uh, Governor Perry, Rick Perry, Rick Perry, yeah, called me on the phone. And I was on a bus because I, I was going out to the Indy 500 to because we were, we were thinking about sponsoring some things there. So they were, you know, trying to wine and dine me. I was like, I don't know anything about Indy 500, right? So I get this phone call. And, you know, I'm like, hello? You know, like, hi, this is Evan. You know, whatever kind of weird ass stupid voice I have. And um, this guy's like, hey, Evan, this is Rick Perry. And I was like, Fuck off. Who is this? <laughs> he's like, he's like quiet. He's like, no, man, Marcus Luttrell gave me your number. I was just, I was like, sorry, sir. I'm uh, a uh, semi retarded person that is capable of doing basic things like, you know, performing, uh, uh, you know, cleanliness and driving myself, sometimes feeding myself outside of those things. Like, you, I apologize. What do you, you want? Know? You just want to say what's up? Because yeah, we're moving, we're opening up a bunch of shit in Texas. Oh, like, yeah, hey, yeah. I want to congratulate you. Like, this is awesome. Come on down, boy. Like, let's let's make this happen. You getting yeah. any cold calls like that? I'm not getting any of those. Madison Cawthorn, I got. That's cool. Madison's no, cool. No, he's cool. You don't Whatever. have any of that. Yeah, because he already lie. knows all those guys. I know. He's he, he's he like friends with all those guys. Him. I don't actually. Keanu Reeves, like he's just. Stop it. I did meet Keanu Reeves about a week ago. Did you really? Where at? Cool dude, huh? I uh, rode a motorcycle with him all day long. And then, uh, oh, you guys never ride with Were him. you on the back or was he on the back? He, I was driving. He was facing me on my lap. <laughs> <laughs> we shared a helmet though. <laughs> Perfect. Is he a cool dude? He was a an extremely. Uh, generous person with his time, super nice. And um, I don't know, people of that level, like what I mean by that is like the- Celebrity status. The world that I, the orbit that I think that they live in, there's a huge disconnect between their daily life and what I think I understand. Right. So it was cool. There was uh, like five or six of us uh, riding bikes that day. He was one of them. We, the the most time I actually spent with him was when we were having- Lunch and he was super cool. And then right. he went home and it's like, hey man, see so yeah, so cool experience. But at the same time, I also am not starstruck by right. yeah. anybody either. Well, I'm not either. Did it's you just not- get like a uh, like a like one of those invitation, like email invitation invites? It was like, hey, do you want to ride motorcycles with so- Keanu Reeves and four other guys <laughs> and eat lunch and fucking my business partner in the coffee shop oh, yeah. has been riding for probably 30 years. And Keanu Reeves and Guard Hollinger have a motorcycle company called Arch. Yeah. He has one of their Super bikes cool. and they'll do owner's event and... What the fuck is an arch? It's a, it's like it's a, a, it's a real motorcycle? motorcycle. Yeah, it's a motorcycle. Yeah, it's, oh, okay, okay. You, so um, mm-hmm. a lot of people associate it with Keanu. I would say actually the heavy hand in that is Guard Hollinger, the guy who's actually figuring right. shit out and doing the geometry and, and all right. that. So we were doing a ride and he um, had just gotten back, I guess, from like basically two years on the road of filming movies, like all the rest of the Matrix ones and the... They're doing stuff. another Matrix? Yeah, I think it's coming out now. And then the John Wick, I think he did two back to back. Had ridden a motorcycle in like eight months. So he was like, hey, if you guys are riding, I'm going to come along with. So I don't know. That's I don't cool. Under- I don't understand the environment that those people live in. Yeah. I don't either. It's weird. Are you starstruck by anybody? No. I, I am, depending on the, like, uh, depending on the person, when I say, like, yeah. depending on the person, but typically those are like, um, like, when I say, Uh, they're they're typically guys that that are 
military, you know, yeah. spooky guys that John you know. Stryker Meyer was. I was just thinking yeah. exactly the same like, thing. Like a, I was yeah. like, oh, dude. Like, like Give me him. A coin? I was like, yeah, that's fucking badass. So or, badass. You know, like that some of podcast was so fun. So Three of them. Oh man. <laughs> so fun. <laughs> but like if you may like like and I I can't really say some of these guys or whatever, but you when you meet somebody that you know is like like Tom Spooner, right? When I first met Tom, yeah. like, that guy's a bad motherfucker. Like Spoon. he's a bad yeah. he's a he's just he's kind of a legend. Yeah, Kyle Lamb. Kyle Lamb, Kyle Lamb Tom though. Spooner. Yeah. Like these guys are legends, right? Yeah. So when you look at those guys, I know what they're what they've done. Yeah. And Jamie Caldwell. I gotta add him too. Jamie Caldwell. Like I know what they've done, or you know, or Andy, you know, or not Andy, or, but, or, yeah. but, guy, but we we all know these guys. Like we, yeah. we know of them. And we know what they've done, and I'm like really fucking impressed by yeah. the fact that they're still like cruising around too. Like just the yeah. fact, like uh, you're walking around, and fucking it's like, oh, that's wild. But yeah, outside of that, like people that play other people, like I really cool. My daughter's like, they're, they they play dress up all the time in the backyard and it's way more entertaining than watching some dumb, dumb fucking memorize a script and yeah. do it for millions of dollars. I'm pretty sure if I got $20 million, I could fucking rehearse and become a pretty goddamn good actor and try Perfect. to fucking I'd be like, what do you want me to do? The, the, you know, you know, who do you want me to be? What's I'll, the sh- I'll, I'll, Seal? What's the Seal show? That, that's still on. There's one that canceled. And there's one that's- Seal Team CBS. Seal Team? Is it yeah. just called Seal Team? Yeah, yeah. because Tyler's a There's good, yeah, yeah Tyler's, Tyler's a good, like, I love Tyler. But th- that main actor that plays, like, maybe the team leader, the troop sergeant major or whatever, he wore a shirt uh, recently that said something like, uh, Did it say this show is gay? It was sim- something similar to that. It was like, uh, support trans children or something like that. And he got a lot of shit. For, I mean, his count got deleted. And I was like, I got lost all respect for that because I don't think children need to be worried about if they're what sexuality, what any sexuality and any sexual. Uh, it's just weird. It's just weird as fuck. It's like, weird. Like let a kid be a kid. Let yeah, him yeah. like sh- baby shark. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know what I mean? Hey, man, just stop. And he's yeah. wearing a shirt about it, and he's like selfieing about whatever. And he's playing a Navy SEAL, like a, a badass SEAL. But uh, what I've realized in those guys' um, uh, social media accounts is they'll post up like they're taking a war photo, like it's real. Like yeah. they're, they're like, I mean, he's the dude's like here with a dog, and he's like, Phew. yeah, and, yeah, and that's his persona. And people are like, oh, that dude's so badass. And I'm like, but, but dude, like he's, that's like, there's a makeup team and like a, that's not real. No, oh, you and guys I'm, don't have that in SF. No, we do. Yeah, yeah we a little yeah, bit. Yeah, we got a, it's just it's a eighteen. It's not as it's robust as you guys. We had a, I had a pocket on my gear, just like mirror, and you <laughs> put it back up. It's so weird to me. That culture is just weird. Well, it's weird. It's weird that people don't understand, and, and I, I, run, I run into this all the time, where people don't understand or can distinguish between fact or fiction, right? It goes back to yeah. our original conversation we were having a little while ago, which is you're, you're, you're fictionalizing these events where like, you're believing this is a real person. Yeah, that's a real person, but they're playing somebody on TV, and you have to kind of like, you know, Tom Cruise is probably a pussy. Like, yeah. you know, Matt Damon plays, you know, Jason Bourne, but he can't do any of that. And I think a lot of people have a hard time distinguishing between fiction and fact because they're like, oh, Matt, Matt Damon, man, I bet he's you a he's a badass. And you're like, I can certainly he's an actor. people would be fooled by that. Are you? Are you, are you concerned? Because it seems fairly be normal. The, it will, <clears throat> normal and concerning can occur mm. in the same sentence, right? If you if you don't have the mental horsepower to work your way through that and realize that their job is to portray multiple people, mm-hmm. I think you might have a hard time separating the wheat from the chaff in everyday mm. life. Yeah. Did you hear the podcast with Rogan and um, Tristan Harris? No. Social dilemma, dude. No, I I I, I, I did watch the show. Which was yeah, disturbing, yeah. but I didn't. Yeah. I didn't listen to the conversation. Yet. So one, of, I mean, one of the one of the main uh, factors in their conversation, they brought in another subject matter expert. I, I, don't, I apologize, I don't know the dude's name, but what they did was they they made all of the 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 indications of a catastrophe taking place in the future based on all of the things that they're seeing, which is social media is driving people's lives and behavior in a very different way, and we all know that it's, that that is the social dilemma. 
But what I, what I realized in that conversation, which they, they, they said, hey, we need to do something about it. And they use Taiwan as an example where they have regulations that are, I guess you, would, you call them ethical regulations. But what I, what I always go back to is the idea that uh, just like with firearms, just like with sugar, sugar is my analogy. Sugar kills more people, arguably, but we all understand it, than anything in the world. Because the leading cause of death is cardiovascular disease, which sugar can be directly attributed to. So when we were kids growing up, we saw commercials like Tony the Tiger. And you're like, fuck yeah, I'm getting pumped. I want to eat that bowl of sugary shit and put it in my, my, my body. Hell yeah. And my dad's like, fuck yeah, let's get more of that. Let's double down and just get all these sugary shit because you're happy. Um, and, 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 and I could see that like, okay, but we don't know what it's doing to our health. It's like the smoking industry, same yeah. thing. But how do you regulate that? Well, you regulate it by putting a sticker on, on the fucking thing. A warning label. A warning mm-hmm. label, a, ta- a tax hike. Yeah. So with social media, it doesn't need to be, I don't think it needs to be regulated. I think at the end of days, what you will have is people that make an educated choice. Like we make choices with guns, like with sugar, with everything in our lives. And we put the fucking phone down. So what we need is more moderate voices. Back to this whole media yeah, thing, yeah. right? Yeah. So. He, let me just say this because people don't understand how this works business-wise. The only way this will work, and this is just me putting on you, is you, right? Because when you look at the infrastructure required to build this thing out, it requires a powerhouse conglomerate of networks, of relationships, and people who are vested. You got people that are vested because we, we texted on a text thread and conversation six major players, including Andy, uh, yeah, including- Minor, minor player. Yeah, you know, major, you, minor. you know, it's funny. It's major, like minor, major out of the group. There's six of them, which are the most, I don't want to say their names because I don't know their, their uh, investment in this. Um, as far as if they're on board, we have to make that argument or make that uh, discussion. When you take it, I'm the least popular dude in the whole group. You're the most popular. Not in the least. Most liked. Maybe most liked, but least popular. <laughs> um, yeah. I'm actually the only one who hasn't been on Rogan. You're the only one. Yeah. That you're the only Asian. I'm the only Asian. I'm right. the diversity. Well, actually, that's there's there's another there's a person of color on there, right. which is she could be. I don't yeah. know. She's not Asian, but she's Pacific Nothing. Islander. Sure. But when you look at that that home run team, that squad, what we're what we're what we're talking about is you have fringe n- networks. Mm-hmm. And I don't, I don't think the Daily Wire is fringe, but they're far right, uh, um, most certainly. I like, like, I like those guys. So, I like, love them. I love them too. Like, I really, I really enjoy because it's a counterbalance. Because when you when you listen to NPR, and I haven't necessarily listened to NPR for years, but I used to listen to their morning show because it was too, yeah. because I don't like turning on the TV. I wanted yeah. uh, like a radio I news news, and I don't, and I just need a summary. I need like these are the things that are happening across the United States. I don't want to listen to. You know, I can't believe these goddamn. You know, yeah. you're like, dude, I just need the facts, man. So I, yeah. I turn it on in the radio, and like NPR's on every radio station, and there's no visual stimuli either, right? So, but I think a lot of it's just like it's counterbalancing. The oh, hundred percent, it is, yeah. So it's nothing derogatory towards any of those guys. It's just no, like, no, hey, no. yeah, yeah, yeah. So you have a seg. What it is is you have a segment. Mm-hmm. Like Blaze TV is certainly the fringe, right? So you have the far right and you have far left, like the Rachel Maddow's of the world, <laughs> the everything CNN of the world. Yeah, or, so, or you got like that the Young Turks, right? Or those guys. Have you ever watched any of that shit? No. Nah. Oh yeah, I think it's. I think that's what it is. There's this fucking crazy like left channel, and I forget what. God, I'll I'll pull it up. Do you know what it is, Derek? What is it called? The Young Turks? Yeah. So like, they're Extreme. nuts. Extreme. Dude, they're crazy. Yeah. They're all like socialist weirdos that are like talking about, you know, we need to unify around the, you know, the sickle and hammer. It's fucking nuts, dude. Yeah. They're, they're fucking Looney Tunes. Well, I think, I think the, the disaffected majority of this country feel like there's not a home. You know, yeah. Andy and me were talking before the podcast. The predictions are about 80% of the country, but uh, I agree with Andy. It's like, it's probably more than that, right? Mm-hmm. So you have, like, let's just say you have 10% on each side and you're looking at 80% of the population. Where do they go for reliable news? Where do they go for commentary that's balanced? And what, what positive critiques I've gotten over the years is like, and I've noticed of Andy as well as you is, yeah, 
that makes sense to me. That doesn't sound that doesn't sound extreme or radical. That sounds like like common sense logic that we're applying to things. And if you're an what's unique about all the players that are in this is they all come from robust robust operational experiences where you find that balance through your experiences. Like you want to go and lay down the hammer, but you can't because you got to build rapport with the the host nation. You, there's there's certain I almost feel like to be on that list, everybody has 10 years of experience operationally and some kind of real experience in life outside of popular culture, it, like overseas right. doing shit. And so when you, when you look at that, if not built in the right structure, it's just, it's a popularity contest. We're talking about it. It sounds good philosophically, but when you actually do it, it could change the country. And, and I, I selfishly think about the, the next election cycle. Mm-hmm. And I think what's going to happen a year leading to this next election cycle, what happened last November times 10, mm-hmm. because now the, the, the social media platforms are emboldened. They'll just turn off. Ev- they will Everything. literally turn off everybody. Yep. They'll have fake algorithms that show you a clicker where you're like, Oh, I'm getting 10,000 likes and you're not getting any exposure. Mm-hmm. Nobody's because you got zero comments, right? right? There's an opportunity for, I think moderate, logical and reasonable human beings to have a conversation that's not fringe, that discuss things. And like we had talked about it, that gives the facts of, of matters that, that mean most to Americans. Like when you talk about a bill that's a thousand pages, nobody knows what the fuck that means. But when you have a human being who's reasonable, who does the research, who could distill that and communicate things that you could uh, uh, understand about your decisions, you're informing the country. And there's none of that now. Because we're either extremely woke or we're extremely radical. And there's no moderate version of that in the middle. And I, I don't think there's an opportunity at any, like when you look at Jocko suppression, up until like a month ago, that wasn't even a thing for Jocko. He, he heard about it every once in a while, but now he's literally getting suppressed. And you're asking, people should be asking the question, why is that dude getting suppressed? Me and Andy are more extreme uh, when we talk about things in podcasts. He doesn't do that at all. So why the fuck is he getting suppressed? Because he's a threat. And now that the, uh, the media owns the narrative, we have no fucking voice. When, when, when I, I laughed uh, yesterday, somebody just sent me a text and I was talking about, they're like, black rifle coffee this, black rifle coffee that. I was like, so what's the issue here? Like, well, I think people are going to be migrating away from black rifle coffee. I was like, black rifle coffee just had a $1.7 billion valuation. They're in tens of thousands of communities <laughs> a- across the nation. I'm involved, Andy's involved. Like these are real world players making a difference in tangible structured business that is unstoppable. And they're like, oh, I didn't realize like it had that much effect. Yeah, because you're watching one window on one platform and one scroll and click and you're not seeing the full picture. When you step back and see the full picture, you'll go, oh fuck, we're behind. We need to do something about this. And I only think that the people that we talked about have the real ability to bring the country together mm-hmm. and stop dividing the country. Well, I think, I think you're right. I think that there's, but I also think that moderates in some ways are seemed as, and they're villainized as extremists by like the left or the right, right? So like I find like Joe is very moderate. Like he is like, People are trying to cancel him, it seems like, every week yeah. because he said something that they don't like. And I think that's the whole thing where, especially for the right, like it's like conservatives should be individual freedom, right? It's like, hey, freedom of speech, liberty, you know, the pursuit of happiness. It shouldn't be so hell-bent on condemning people that have contradictory ideas. Mm. Because that's, that's, that's like the extreme left. That's their job, right? It's like, hey, you, you're a, you know, you're a, uh, you know, if you're a, a, a socialist or a Marxist, like that's your, that's your deal. But not ours. Ours should be like, when I say ours, I'm lumping everybody into a somewhat of a, the same bucket. I'm just saying like, I had this conversation with somebody the other day. I was like, you can't just say that I'm for freedom here, but then you go to the buffet of rights. It's like, no, you're for either individual freedom and you don't get to pick and choose because we were talking about um, abortion. That's what that's that was the topic. Because I was like, you're you're contradicting yourself. 
you're a conservative and you're about individual freedom and liberty, but you're also saying this should be illegal and we should mandate the federal government to do it. So at the same time, you're contradicting these two things. People do it all the time with the Constitution. They do. They're, They're like, the first, I like this one, second. but I don't like yeah. this one. Yeah. I like this one. I don't yeah. like this one. I'm like, or they want to strip the fifth away from some people, or some people shouldn't have a jury of their peers. Right. They should be just fucking lit on fire in the public square. Yeah. It's it's not a buffet. It's this is what we stand for. I get for all of it, or maybe we should not right. stand for any of it. Well, and we were talking about that. We, I think Dan uh, Crenshaw and Jared, we were, we were having that conversation. I think the, among um, among us because he was talking about you know, drugs. When we're talking about drugs and we're talking some of the other things. I'm like, I can say that I, I don't find it ethically appropriate, right? So from my personal perspective, I'm completely against abortion from my personal perspective. That's my own personal belief. Mm-hmm. So I can take that to my family and we can believe in that. And that's, that's but I'm not going to tell my neighbors. Yeah, you're not going to mandate it. And it just like, I'm not going to do that for like the drug conversation. That's what we were having a conversation about. It was like the legalization of marijuana across the United States. And I was like, it's a big win for individual liberty. It's a big win. You know why? Because you get to choose. Just like, you know, psilocybin or half of these other things that people don't get to choose and they don't have the option. And maybe it might help them. Maybe the THC or CBD or whatever it might be. Maybe it, that does help you. And oh, by the way, who cares if people want to use it recreationally? I mean, they can go to the liquor store and buy, you know, a shopping cart full of poison and, you know, and kill themselves that night with a bottle of liquor. But you're, you're also completely contradicting yourself and saying, well, but the Fed needs to step in and really control this. I'm like, not really. Like, I, I don't necessarily believe in that. So, I, and, I, and I'm not saying that people can't be hypocritical because that's part of the human experience. Like, you're just going to be a hypocrite because your mind isn't diverse enough in order to stay within the lines of a very strict doctrinal, you know, outline. It's just not possible because it's a big fucking sphere of gray matter with a ton of folds and you're going to have a bunch of different competing opinions and you're never going to be able to just completely conform. That's why these things just don't work because it's a human experience, right? It's very fucking diverse. But people aren't even capable of having a complex dialogue they're not, not capable of it. Mm. I'm not saying they're not capable because they don't have the IQ. I think they're not capable of it because they don't feel that they will be socially accepted by a peer group if they don't conform strictly to an ideology. I find they're very capable, but only in person. Oh, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. The internet is just a shitty place to have those conversations. It's not designed around complexity and nuance. And it goes back to all the, the shit comments that I was looking at on Twitter. Mm-hmm. Like, that's just not my experience in the real world. Because when I sit down and I can and have had conversations with people that believe largely the opposite of what I believe, we don't scream at each other. No. We don't yell at each other. I'll ask questions like, oh, so why do you feel that way? Or I mean, one of my favorite questions to ask people is, you know, what information would it take to change your position on this? Or if this is what you believe, is there a threshold of information that could be provided that would sway your opinion? Because I think that's an important question for people to ask themselves about what they believe. Why do I believe what I believe? What's it based off of? And what actually would it take for me to change my opinion on something? I've never had one of those conversations online. No. But I I have them, I'm not going to say all the time, but it's occurred quite a few times face-to-face. I think it's possible, but the mediums that we have available for speed, they suck. They suck. Yeah. Well, you're you're distilling complex conversations down to a very simplistic form of communication that is not, it's also very new for even humanity and in, in this circumstance. Somebody saying, well, you're just a cuck, fuck you. Yeah. And then it's like <laughs> moving on to the moving next. Moving on to the next idiot. <laughs> you know, like, oh, okay. So yeah. they're, they're you're you'll not bump capable. up against their ideology and the, the response that I find most often is it then becomes that ad hominem attack. Right? I'm like, mm. fuck you. I'm like, Oh, yeah. okay. We've hit the we've hit the gates, we've right? Hit the walls of the castle. Moving on to the next. Well, I, and some of that is like I think it's driven specifically. And I, I, I had a conversation with a guy that that uh, that used to do. Um, well, this was like last year, but he used to do trace back the uh, external or outside influences specifically related to like Facebook. When, when all the Russia, you know, interference stuff started coming out, like they went and did a very complex investigation as to how many people were out there interfering and putting out 
false information. Where was it coming from? And it was a lot of it was coming from outside of the United States. There were like, you know, 19 out of 20 fake accounts directly associated with this. And I think uh, Joe might have had somebody on the show talking about this as well. Talking about with Jocko. Was he? And it yeah. Was for whatever reason, they were uh, Christian accounts. Like, yeah, yeah, accounts. yeah, yeah, yeah. And they were doing the same thing, yep. but they were talking about, you know, you know, you'd have like certain really hot topics that would really galvanize people. And then you'd have all these different, you know, Russian click farms or whatever, you know, Pakistani click farm, you know, filling in the comments, spinning people up. And that would really get, you know, people activated. It really would. And that's, that's some scary shit when you think about how people are being activated on social media across across the United States and how they're being directly manipulated by our most strategic threats that really have something to gain. We have nothing to gain as a country by being divided. Like we have nothing. It, it is it is fucking lost. It is gone. We have everything to gain by being united. But who does? And that's where you have to really look at it. It's like who gains? From us being at our at each other's throats, because it's not America and it's not it's people that enough, love yeah. this country. It's China, it's Russia, it's North Korea, it's fucking Iran. It's all of our strategic enemies. They gain, so of course they're going to exploit and explode any circumstance that they can because they they're directly benefiting from that circumstance. And for me, I'm like. How can you guys not see what's going on? Like, I, I always want to go, can, can you not see? Like, everybody has access to the internet. Anybody can make a stupid account. Anybody can do this anytime they want. I think they need bit better information, which kind of ties back to your idea, which yeah. again goes back completely onto Evan's shoulders. So it's either yeah, it's up all to me. you, Evan, or... Yeah. Well, I, the, the, <laughs> the interest, the positive side of social media that I've seen, and, and the very... I was very surprised by this as I kind of evolved on my social media and platforms, which sounds weird saying you're an influencer. But I think what I realized is a lot of people, especially young men in my case, uh, and, and men, period, um, they want mentorship. Mm -hmm. they, want, they want leadership. Right. They want, they want to follow a role model who's leading them in the right direction, who's mm -hmm. positive, who, all these good things, these aspects. Which is, I, which is why I think all these people gravitate to Andy, myself, even you, and finding that where they go, what is this guy saying? Mm -hmm. What's this dude wearing? Like, I want to be like this guy. And so when you see that, that social impact in a positive way, you have to, to me, you have to scale and evolve that. I, I, like, it's a burden of responsibility that I want to go, oh, fuck, I do not want to fuck with this. But when I look at the place that we're at, the only way to counter that negative interaction. Like I, I got, like I, I tell people at um, these survival engagements at Black Ruffle Coffees. Yeah. Um, I just convinced 200 of you to show up through a post, like one mm -hmm. post. And you all bought the ticket that's going to Warrior's Heart, $25 per slot and convinced you here in a post to show up. What makes you think that I can't convince you to show up at a protest and mm -hmm. burn the place to the ground? So we could use this for good or, or for evil. And so when I look at the scale of this, when you consolidate efforts, when you put capital behind it, when you're doing it for the right reasons, what you're doing is you're mentoring the country. And there's nobody, like, like I love Ben Shapiro. Mm -hmm. I love these, uh, some of these personalities and their intellect is, is, their, is their benefactor because they're super intellectual, they're super intelligent. They're distilling a lot of chaos in, into informative information, right? But when you take a guy like, me, you, Andy, a Jocko, and you look at the experience in their lives, what more validation can you get from somebody who's communicating anything? And if they're taking that leadership role, what they say is what you'll get. And so what I think is going to happen if, if this goes off the right way in the task organization is you're, you're really influencing for the better. You have a guy like Andy who's talking about a show who's giving information and inspiring people to get off their ass and do something about it. That's what we do in our podcast in a lot of ways. But when you consolidate the effort and you get serious about it, people go, where is the reliable voice that I'm willing to listen to and be influenced by in a, in a discussion, not, not, a, not a pro tip, not a, not a clickbait headline, but actual discussion? That changes the world because 80% of the country is looking for that I'm looking for it in my own way. So mm -hmm. I listen to Andy's podcast. I listen to your interviews. 
with uh, uh, people who are influential. And that's how I get it. But there's not one place that you can go where you can get that dynamic diversity. Um, and I think you only get that from a veteran experience. And I, I don't want to isolate veterans here, but let's be fucking real. Like what kind of life, like you take a guy who's got an MBA. You take a guy who has, uh, who's a shark and has done business. Like you take that narrow experience and it's a thing. It should be beneficial. But when you take the overall scope of somebody's experiences in an operational capacity, fighting the GWAT for 20 fucking years, transitioning that into business or whatever it is, leadership, that is a whole completely different type of experience. And I'm not, I'm not uh, inspired by the business guys, by the, by the um, philosophers. By, I'm inspired by the guys who have this realm of experience and they could distill this information for me. I mean, you know, like, like Andy Stump. Uh, he won't say this, but like a, a na- career Navy dude, uh, enlisted dude, an officer, a pilot, a wingsuit flyer, a base jumper, like a, a entrepreneur, a jujitsu guy, like handsome, a handsome, handsome dude, and you and you <laughs> take that handsome. Like that's the fucking guy I want to listen to. That's the guy I want my son to listen to. Yeah, and I think that that's the difference because I think there's a lot of people that would say, you know, we'll use Andy in a very, you know, because he's at the table. We'll use him in this circumstance. Because there's a lot of people that would say, because you've exemplified what it's like to live life in the context of you've tried to do multiple things and been successful at achieving your goals and objectives. <clears throat> I think people, if they're living life without goals and objectives, then they're searching for some type of leadership and they need experience-based knowledge, not theory. Yes, It's not theory. Yeah. And the difference is, it's, 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 Huge. There's there's miles of difference between a person that's talking about accomplishing goals based on theory and accomplishing goals based on experience. And so that's where you, I, from my experience at least, like I'm looking at those guys to include the guys that I knew within you know our former lives as you know a special operations guy or a CIA guy or whatever. I was looking always looking at the guys where the guys I want to follow were the guys that had the experience or like yeah. when you looked at a guy, when you first came in, you know, you, you first came into the mill, it was like, there's only a few guys that had been to combat and you saw who it was because you could see it on their uniform. Like that guy's a CIB. You know, some of those guys had like mustard stains on their, you know, jump lanes. It was like, that guy was in Panama. That guy is a CIB. I want to learn yep. how to conduct warfare with that guy, not the other guy. Like that's the guy because he's validated that this experience-based knowledge, which ultimately equates to wisdom, which I think I used to talk about this a little bit where you, know, you have to have intelligence, right? There's like the pillars of wisdom from my, from my perspective where like you have to be intelligent. You have to have some formal education in the subject. You have to have experience and then you have to have the means in order to communicate all of that. So it's like intelligence, you know, education, experience, and communication. It's the four legs to the stool of wisdom. You don't go to the guy that just has an education. They have a low IQ. They have no experience and they can't fucking communicate it. It doesn't make any sense. You're like, who the fuck is this? There's no way I want to listen to this person. It doesn't make sense. So I think having that, our background, that's who you used to always go to. Like, you don't want to learn how to gunfight from a guy that's only been doing it theoretical. You, you, I mean, we, we saw that guy. He was in Maryland, right? He was running a dojo before he started teaching, like, you know, Wang Chung. Dude, that, that guy doesn't know shit about surviving a gunfight. Like, where I want to go to learn how to survive a gunfight is from the guys that have actually survived gunfights. And then you're like, oh. And then it dawns on you. You're like, that makes a ton of sense. Think about all the shit that you had like light bulbs go on where it was theory, theory-based tactics. And then you applied those theory-based tactics and it all turned to shit. It didn't make any sense. I'll tell you exactly one. One, for instance, was that SOP that we used to always use was a posing corner four-man CQB. Mm-hmm. Doesn't work. Mm-hmm. Doesn't work. It might work or might have worked in certain circumstances. But the first time you run a live target and you try to do a posing corner, yeah. four-man CQB, on 
A okay. three room fucking multi level, you know, target with furniture and fucking kids and everything else in it. It is a shit show because you're like, number two takes two. You remember that bullshit? Uh, everybody remember this? Like the two man takes two corners. Well, the first time you run into a couch and a lamp and everything else, and then there's like beds and people sleeping all around, you fucking get caught up in blankets. You're like, <laughs> I can't get to the other side of that room. Let alone, maybe you only have six guys on target. Yeah. How the fuck are you supposed to clear it? Four men per room. Four men per room. <laughs> yeah. Two takes two. If you would have tried to follow that template, not modify your tactics and techniques in order to be successful in the target, we would have fucking been like getting our just smashed on a regular. Like, there's no way. So then when you you had to modify your tactics and techniques based on your experience and you realize that theory didn't fucking work. But you still had to understand the principles of combat, speed, surprise, violence of action. You had to fucking understand all that. You had to be like digest it and then create and curate tactics that actually worked based on the circumstance. Mm. And then I found that when the people with the real world experience were coming back, some of the, those that would push back the hardest against a change in that theory were the ones who used to be teaching it but had no real world experience to back it up. They would. Because it was a threat. It was a, I guess it was a threat to their knowledge base, but it was a knowledge base that wasn't earned through experience. But they, they would, they would dig in and bury their flag in the old tactics. Like, hey man, like this shit is not what we're seeing for real. So we need to change it. And they, they would oftentimes not want to initially. Oh, ton of guys. Until the fucking tsunami of feedback and information, they had no choice. Yeah. I mean, mean, like borderline fistfights on a regular. For sure. Like people getting so mad over tactics where you're like, I, I remember having like this fucking almost like come to blows with a guy in, you know, in the middle of some training facility somewhere and where he was telling me that prone doesn't work anymore. And I was like, you're fucking high as a kite, man. I don't know what the fuck you're talking about. You're just being lazy. Prone, as long as projectiles have been flying around in the fucking sky, like having a low profile will work in some circumstances depending on, you can't just eliminate that from your tool chest. That's fucking ridiculous. Like, what are you crazy? You know, and I was like, so pissed off. He's like, yeah, prone doesn't work. And I was like, what planet are you fucking working on, man? He's from the planet where he's never actually had incoming projectiles at thousand feet per second. (laughs) And what? Snapping by your- I really need to get low. Snapping by your head and all you have to hide behind is a rock about the size of your fucking (laughs) head. (laughs) <laughs> and you hide behind it and on you, your belly. On your belly. Yeah. <laughs> because <laughs> you're not going to be standing. Serp- like Serpentine. You're not going to be standing. Like, you're just not. Like, I remember that clean as day. I was wearing a fucking ball cap. Started the invasion with a ball cap. Ballistic? No, it was a foam. <laughs> it was a white foam trucker with a fucking pink hand, loose hand. Oh. Started that. Because I was like, it's a fucking cakewalk, man. Like, I'm a fuck. Yeah, they didn't last very long. Yeah. I was like, I'm going to put a helmet on. Like, can I have side plates for my shit? Can I get side plates? Do we have any more armor I can maybe (laughs) duct tape to myself? Those blankets, armor blankets. Can we put something else? Go back through historical images of like knights. Like, can we make that out of Kevlar? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, I mean, the like, no no time in history has um, kind of guys and gals with our experience come out and been so transparent. Right? Which has yeah. been like people are like, oh my god, these guys are coming out of the shadows and telling all the secrets. Like, no, that's not happening. Really? Oh, these are quiet professionals and they run their mouth. Uh, no, I wouldn't put it that way. So when when you take like a Wolf Blitzer or a Don Lemon, they're talking heads, right? They just run their fucking mouths, and they and they don't expose all their weaknesses because yeah. they're not willing to have that conversation. But when you do a podcast, when you do this kind of interaction, and it's long form. You can't hide. Like if you're asked the right questions and you you just can't hide. That's why Rogan's, I think Rogan's popularity has to do with this, this transparency and honesty that people really want versus the, the clickbait puppeteer who's like, what the fuck is going on? Like a corporate structure owns this entity and there's talking heads and this dude's making $5 million a year running this fucking mouth off a teleprompter. Like people are done with that shit. They're done. And And I'm, I'm glad to see that if it wasn't for social media where for the first time, people can't hide, then you wouldn't have this, these long-form conversations. Even though it's blitzed with all this temporary shit, there is value in this long-form discussion of the podcast, the interactions on social. And I love that because now when people are looking, when that young man who's like, I want to go to Ranger Regiment, I want to be a Navy SEAL, 
when they come out and they go, who am I going to pay attention to? This dick bag who's talking about his Lambos, his Ferraris and how badass he is. This athlete who is, is, is running his, I mean, LeBron James is who I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 or am I going to pay attention to this? I don't know. This person who's, who has humility, who gives a shit about people, who has a, a, a world of experiences and trauma and war and service and entrepreneurship where I'm like, yeah, maybe I want to be like that guy. Maybe this aspiration of being a, a conceited fucking ball player who gets paid millions of dollars playing a fucking game. Maybe I want to be like that guy. And, and there's nobody doing that right because their reference for experiences is, no, no offense to Ivy League education, but it's the professor, like you said, who's talking from a position of theory, but has never really fucking lived it. I, I'm going to teach you guys the MBA and teach you how to run a business but you've never really run a successful business. So how the fuck are you here? And there are exceptions to that, obviously. But when you take but that- But they're the exception, not the They're the, the exception, not the rule. You have the, when you have the vertical, the, 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 the rungs that are part of this ladder and everybody pulls to that, I think it changes, uh, I, I think it changes our position in the US for the world. Um, because we're so disaffected, we're so dis- divisive. And then what you do see is when everybody turns off uh, all the social media platforms because they don't want to incite or, or get the vote, you have a pool of people who are paying attention, who are mm. getting informed, who are like, huh, I don't need to pay attention to these fucking rogue actors. I can get education here and then I could vote for the right person. Or maybe the people who are involved in it are the right people. You know, maybe, maybe you know, I, I, my, my thing is like, I like uh, DeSantis, Tulsi, and, um, and Jocko. I think those three personally on any ticket in any combination would be the right ticket because of who they are and their experiences. Uh, nothing to do with based on their fucking education, but based off of what they've done in the real world, their, their action, not mm-hmm. their words. No pressure. No yeah, fucking yeah. Pressure, no pressure, guys. No pressure. Yeah. No. <laughs> yeah, I think that that's, I mean, I think America has to look at itself as a leader. Right? And, and they need to assume responsibility of leadership across the world and because everybody's looking at America. Like whether or not people want to buy into that perception, it is reality. Yeah. It is reality. Yeah. So the more that they look at this country as we are leaders of the world, not just the free world, the world. Yes. And so when we elect these, like, this, you know, lobotomized fucking, you know, geriatric Dude, he's to, dead. To, to lead. Like, God. he's not possible. He's it's just dead. not possible. And it's, and it's not me getting into some weird political thing, but it's like, we should be ashamed of ourselves for even moving this person through the primaries and then allowing them to lead. That is a disservice to the position and to the country and to where it actually, to where we have to be, I think, as, as a global leader. And I, out of all the, 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 you know, the million and a half people that have served in the, in the United States military over the course of the last you know, 20 years, and then more, if we go even further, it's like that's the last place in America that they're really emphasizing leadership as a skill too. Like they're actually teaching it as a skill. You know, military is like one of the last places. So the more woke the mill becomes, actually, some of this I'm like, whatever, but you can't lose the ability to teach leadership, teach principles and understand what it means in order to self-sacrifice for the greater good, for the, not only the greater good of the humanity, but the greater good of the country and the greater good of the platoon or the company or whatever it might be. It's like we're doing an extreme disservice to the emphasis of leadership. Mm. And when we don't value that and really curate it and promote it as something that actually belongs in our society, we fuck ourselves. And that's where this participation trophy bullshit doesn't work because it's contradictory to human behavior. It's completely contradictory to human behavior. We think about like thousands of years of human evolution, if you believe in that. <laughs> uh, there was tribal elders and chiefs. There's always been either a collective identification of the person that quite possibly could lead and then a definable capabilities or definable capabilities that allow them to be put into that position, but it's contradictory to human behavior to say that everybody's the same. We're not. Because it's, not, it's just not factual. I mean, yeah. and 
everybody is not built for that either. And it doesn't, like from my perspective, it's like there are some guys that are really fucking great natural. We know them. I mean, they're very good. And then they've refined that through experience and education. And you think about guys out there that have spent their lives studying and then living it through experience. Like we should be, we should be taking those people, <laughs> putting them on a special island somewhere going, good God, you guys, we have to protect and nourish your knowledge regarding this skill because it is so paramount to the survival of our society. And I think more so is, is as the country, it has to continue to evolve. But when you look at it, it's devoid of leadership. It gets devoid, like right? Because it's there is no moral or ethical boundaries. It's like just about hyperbole and clicks and, you know, views and about, you know, posturing with wealth or whatever it might be. It's not about like this person and whether people like him or not, but Mattis is a good example where he was a intellectual. He is a, a, a intellectual in the art of not only warfare, but leadership. And that from what I understand of the guy, he would read, he's read thousands of books. Yeah. On just leadership and history and warfare. He's a true historian and intellectual in the capacity of warfare and leadership. And regardless of, you know, we'll call it, you know, political views or what the person has, has done, you should still value the, the brain matter that that guy's been spilling out. Einstein wasn't right about everything, but he's celebrated as the most, you know, uh, the, the, the most iconic intellectual in, 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 in history, but he wasn't right a hundred percent of the time. So it's like, man, the, the expectation of the purity police is that you're going to be right a hundred percent of the time. And if you're not, then fuck you, you're wrong all the way around. It's like, oh, that's complete horseshit. We should transition into this Duke Cannon thing though. I mean, <laughs> one of us came prepared, Mike. <laughs> I got a medium. It was too small. Could put it's so good. shit. Okay. <laughs> We're going to have a friendly competition. On what? What are you guys going to compete in? We're actually just competing to see who can give back more money to the charity of our choice, essentially. <laughs> I mean, That's what really, I love about it. It's, kind of, it's a win-win, right? So Duke Cannon, interestingly enough, so they reached out to me. Um, I, my kids actually love their stuff. And for people who, I'm, I would do a shitty job of describing what Duke Cannon is. They make what I'm going to call grooming supplies. Sure. Uh, somehow I, I feel like- soap. Yeah. Somehow I feel when you say grooming supplies, you're talking about pets though. Is there yeah. a different term for humans? I think uh, you can use it. It's like balm and like hygiene. It's not hygiene. It's like so I'm, uh, I'm going to say men's it's, grooming supplies. It's, yeah, high end grooming very, supplies. It's a bunch of military guys trying to determine what this actually means through words. We need yeah. to come up yeah. with like an acronym. You here's know? here's yeah. what I did to, <laughs> last year. MGS. I, I, men's grooming supplies. Yeah. I for I have two sons who are now 18 and 16. Their stockings last year were full of soap because they fucking stink. They're yeah. they're okay. savages they're and they have an allergic reaction to like showering and taking a bath sometimes. Yeah. But they, so like soaps, deodorants, stuff like that. So I, I actually was very familiar with the product and they did a few ad reads on the podcast this year. So they reached out and the guy was like, hey, do you want to be involved in a contest that is literally has nothing to do with me really doing anything? It's all based around the Army Navy football game. If the Army wins, Mike's charity of choice gets a hundred grand and my charity of choice will still get 25 grand. If the Navy wins, which they will, because, and I actually had to research this, in the history of the Army-Navy game, the Army's actually never won. Shut up. Are you serious? No, I have no idea how many times they've won, but I just, I'm going to say things like that. That's complete bullshit. I was like, what are you talking about? The I'm fact like, oh my God. I know nothing I about sports, but I know that's complete bullshit. Oh man, you could, oh, So I would get a hundred grand to, I'm not actually going to touch the money. It's going to go directly to a charity and then your charity would get 25 grand. They're calling it the wager. Yes. For the next, this will come out Monday. So when people are listening, this will be Monday. For the rest of the week, we're going to talk shit on each other online to try to get people involved. I love that. But it's a win-win. Because it's a win-win. even if I lose, I'm still going to direct 25 grand towards the Navy SEAL Foundation. If Mike wins, he's going to direct 100 grand towards your <laughs> ridiculous BRCC fund. I mean, it's <laughs> fine. Beer fund. People should really look into how that money's spent. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. It's I, an amazing I, charity. I love either it. Either way, Two charities are going to get donations based around a college football game, which is actually what the Army-Navy game is. We were discussing this downstairs. It's not some crazy shit. They're just midshipmen, or what do you guys call them in the Army? Yeah. They're midshipmen as well? Cadets. 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 Cadets and midshipmen. The Navy is midshipmen. Annapolis. Right. 
Does that mean you're like you're mid ship? You're not like I have been to Annapolis zero times. I have good. no idea what any of their terminology means. <laughs> Solid. So, so wait, they're could. So the shipping. army team is cadets because mm-hmm. they're all West Point guys. Yeah, it's West Point versus Annapolis. Oh, I'm a dummy. I thought there was an army pro team. Really? Of like dudes that I didn't Are you realize. Out of your fucking mind? Dude, I don't even know. Like I'm not a like I stopped watching football when the last time Joe Montana threw the Jerry Rice. <laughs> when Jerry Rice hung it up, I'm like I'm out. Peace, peace out. Like right, Joe Montana right. was the man. That, no, that was when right. football was. That's cool. about so when non- I. That's about when I stopped watching it yeah, too. Like yeah. that was that was about the for right. For clarity, everybody, the non-professional army team will be playing the non-professional navy team. For those of you who stopped watching, <laughs> so it's football. college. It's college, college. college football. It's college, college football. football. What, yeah. Yeah. Do like the the idea like number one. It corp- was their idea. You recommended that they get Jocko instead. I thought Dude, he was serious. Oh my god! <laughs> Let me tell you this. But I like you want to feel like a pile of shit. So I so Duke Cannon see he cc's me on Duke Cannon's conversation where they're like, hey, you, you want to be part of this? And I trying to be a sarcastic asshole, not understanding the gaps of communication in written form. I type an email. I'm like, I know he's on it. So I'm, he CC'd, hey, are you sure you guys, like, I understood why you chose me. Are you sure me, you guys want to use Andy? I, why you, <laughs> I legitimately think that we could get Jocko. So I responded. That's a good point. I, and yeah. I took it as a good point. I responded. I'm like, hey, I'll fucking bow out. Like his platform is multiples <laughs> the size of mine. Like, I don't give a shit. I, I just want to get money into the he right He texts me. And then I go mule deer hunting. So I'm off the grid for like, 18 hours, but right before I lose cell coverage, I text Mike. I'm like, hey man, if you guys want to go with Jocko, just let me know. And then I put- Dude, I like texted like a hundred. I was like a chick. I was like, bro, you know I'm joking. Hello? Has anybody emo- thumbs up I emoji? No cell like, what's up? And then and then he gets back. And I'm like, dude, I was totally joking. And then I got on the the email and I felt like I walked into a room where like the joke's on me. I'm like, hey, everybody, everybody's cool, right? Because the because the dudes are like, oh no, 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 we we want to go with Andy. And I'm like, no, I was fucking joking. <laughs> I'm sending emojis like, hey, I was just... It was all fucked up, man. Dude. Yeah, it was all fucked up. I felt like shit. I felt like dog shit after that. But I, I think it's cool that like a company, like uh, most companies, including all three of us, have given back in some way. Yep. Um, you, you obviously on a big scale, like we're, we've been part of some of those I'm, things. Warrior's Heart everybody. is what we're giving back to as well for every uh, BRCC engagement that Phil Craft's involved mm-hmm. in. And... and these companies get an allocation typically where they go, hey, let's take a part of our proceeds of profit or part of our profit and mm-hmm. proceeds and donate it to something that's a good cause. I think, I think it's just cool that they, they thought about us because um, I want to give back, but it's a small amount when I look at potentially being able to affect, I mean, whether it's BRCC Fund or Save Our Allies or Mighty Oaks Foundation mm-hmm. or Warriors Heart, these companies that are these nonprofits that I, I work with and see where the money goes. It's a big freaking deal, man. Yeah, it's a huge. Big it's deal. huge. It's a huge deal. And, so the ask, and the ask for us is super small. Try to yeah. drive awareness and attention towards yeah. it. And yeah. it like it's win-win. Yeah, it's a win-win. It's I, win-win. I love but that. Yeah. This stuff's always a win-win. Like it really is. Yeah. Like, like that's one of the reasons why we because we, we were giving away hundreds of thousands of dollars and and to the right causes. And I was like, we just need to pivot this in the context of because we we get thousands of emails, you know, where should I donate? What should I do? So it's like, well, let's just pay for all the compensation for the, the guys that actually run the fund. So a hundred percent of the proceeds go back to veteran related causes. Like we've been given $5,000 a week to veteran small businesses yeah. uh, or small businesses that help veterans. So yeah. it's, it can be either one. Um, Which that's it, not a normal model for nonprofits because mm-hmm. most prof- nonprofits have overhead. They do, yeah. yeah. It, it, and, and a lot of them are really well run. They'll have like 90% of it goes back. But you know, our commitment's always been uh, 100%. So we always pay you know, travel and compensation, everything for anybody running it. And then that way, 100% of the proceeds go back to a lot of these different initiatives that we're trying to do. Then we'll team up with other nonprofits and fund different initiatives. Um, and we've, we've been able to do a ton of really, really good stuff. We fund a research pro- project with uh, Hunter Seven on, you know, chemical exposure and the yeah, high rate man. of cancer. Excuse the me. early, the early data coming out on that is guys like us are about two and a half times more likely to develop cancer than a person that hasn't uh, deployed. It scares the shit out of me. And yeah. so yeah, it kind of does. It's, it's it's one of the the I think it's probably one of the leading issues that we're going to face from a generational perspective. 
it, it's it's our Agent Orange, right? It's it's going to be our Agent Orange. So it's one of the things I've been really trying to focus a lot of attention on. Obviously, we, we've done a ton of stuff with um, like adaptive athlete shoots and getting people out and active. But the other piece is, is, is going to be long-term health and chemical exposure from whatever reason. And a lot of us have lived what from the outside, we look really good, right? I mean, I'm not saying like hot. I'm saying like, we look like healthy people. But when you look at the 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 issues that we've encountered in our adult lives, you know, trash pits, biochem sites, like, or just the residual of the chemical. I mean, yeah. I mean, I'm sure both of you still remember what a Carl Gustav smells like. Yeah. It smells great. Combustion. Time fuse. Like if I've, I've actually mm. had this conversation with people like you're sitting in a movie theater and you smell what you think is time fuse. What do you do? <laughs> <laughs> Guys, it's so fucking yeah, unique. Yeah. Yeah. Or C4. Or yeah, yeah. C4. Like. C4. Or brass or a kill house. The metallic taste that's Oof. that coats your mouth in a kill house. Well, I didn't think about that. Think about how many times like we were sitting, it, it could be as easy as like a solvent tank. Oh God! Like yeah. Scrubbing carbon yeah. with bare hands, bare hands, yeah. dipping Copenhagen up brass with your hat. Yeah, scraping and, and then putting it back on your head, <laughs> mm-hmm. and like, oh, just oh, hey, we're gonna go down and work in a in a you know in a shoot house for a week. We're gonna do a bunch of live breaching, and we're gonna do a bunch of other bullshit in it. And we're, I mean, how many times were you guys wearing uh, pro masks? And you're doing all that shit. It's fucking time. boom, fucking yeah. dust and everything is in the air and you're fucking moving through it and there's everything else. With, we had N95 masks. Constantly. Safety first. You yeah. you did really? Every run. You're bullshit. <laughs> yeah. It's not right like, to see no, the yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. saw one ever. <laughs> well, and then think yeah. about the think about even exterior breaching and interior breaching, even on compounds that we we're in, like what the fuck? Well, it goes beyond that too. Look how we got there. The the chemicals involved with the helicopters, the hydraulic fluid, the exhaust, dude. You know all of that stuff. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. We so, need to get tested. Like I, that. That's the one thing. Like the silent killer. Like you go through all the shit. You these world experiences where you survive, and you get taken out by a fucking cancer or something. Just something dumb. Dick Meadows. You know who that is. Yeah. So you know, Dick Meadows died of cancer uh, in the seventies. And Dick yeah. Meadows is like an icon of uh, SF history. He's, he's an incredible human being. There's a great book out there about Dick Meadows. If you guys, if you guys uh, want to pick it up, but it's a recent too. It's a it's a recent book, right? A couple ten years. years. Oh, okay. yeah, because I picked it up like ten years right when it came yeah. out. Um, he was still alive at that point. No, no, he, he died. He di- no, he died like back in the seventies, dude. Oh, he did. Yeah, and well, he died of that. cancer because of Agent Orange. <laughs> and Dick Meadows was like the poster boy SF guy that. Yeah, uh, the bronze statue, I think, in in Swick might be, um, it it might be of of Dick Meadows, but this guy, I, he lived an incredible life. But in the last several years, he was testifying in front of Congress and going to war, basically, with the United States government over Agent Orange. And a wow. lot of people wow. in the SF community, specifically, don't realize that. One, Dick died of cancer at a very young age. And two, he was like holding people to task like every day for the last several years of his life until the day that he fucking died about Agent Orange and cancer and the chemical exposures to soldiers in Vietnam. Um, It's something that people don't realize about Audie Murphy. Like Audie Murphy was admittedly had PTS. Mm -hmm. Admittedly, he was self-medicating and he was talking about shell shock back then he was one of the only people talking about shell shock and people don't realize that either. So yeah. these like iconic military individuals that have talked about these things at depth and length and they still are kind of forgotten pieces of history. Um, well, congratulations on the uh, the competition. We'll have to see whatever. What are you guys competing at? Do you know? Who wins? There's That's no it. I thought you guys were going to yeah. do a secondary competition. I thought so too. Um, but now it's like- We a, can. What do you want to do? That's easy. I was we'll thinking, do a daily online competition. What do you want to do? Ooh, that that could be anything. It'd be awesome. It, it could be. I, yeah. What I like is the like the field day mm-hmm. throwback because in field day I have a whole bunch of ribbons from kindergarten where I was right. beating some ass. Yeah, yeah. The free throw, second place. Uh, the spoon run with the egg, mm-hmm. first place. Potato sack race. Oh yeah, yeah. I'll fuck you yeah. up on all that. Yeah. What, do you think so? Oh, I know so. I'm a mm-hmm. superior athlete. Yeah. 
I don't know. Often, <laughs> often wrong, never in That's doubt. That's debatable. Often uh, wrong, never doubt is in the notes and <laughs> produced in a variety of patches, all sorts of shit. We should wrap this up. Thank you, guys. Gotta, I appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Thank you again to Babbel for supporting this episode of the podcast. Right now, when you purchase a three-month Babbel subscription, you'll get an additional three months for free. That's six months for the price of three. Just go to Babbel.com and use the promo code Cleared Hot. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Thanks for taking the time to tune in, whether you're listening on an audio-only platform or you're watching on YouTube. I appreciate that you take the time every week to tune in. People ask me a lot, what can they do to help me spread the word? And the answer is actually embedded in the question. The biggest thing you guys can do to help me if you enjoy the podcast and you think it would be helpful to others is subscribe and Share it with other people. And if you have the time, go on to Apple Podcasts and leave me a rating and a review. If you think the podcast sucks, tell me it sucks and leave a zero-star review or the lowest stars possible. If you have a question, comment, or suggestion, you can go to clearedhotpodcast.com. And there is a contact me button right there, which will land in my inbox. And the last thing, if people are interested in helping out, what you can do is fly the old flag. And by that, I don't mean an actual flag because I don't have any of those. I'm talking about t-shirts or sweatshirts or hats, whatever it may be. Again, clearedhotpodcast.com. Click on the shop tab and hopefully something in there looks like it would be an item you would like to wear around town. And then you can tell people what it is when they ask you. But that is it. The biggest thing I can say is thank you. I truly appreciate it. Until next time. See you.